my channel, we like to get things designed to the nines for as little as possible while still not sacrificing quality. So on this episode, I have compiled some of my best DIYs, knockoffs and dupes. We are gonna be saving a ton of money, so let's get started. All right, so straight out of the gate, I wanted to do something brand new. So this is a brand new dupe. I was doing some research for my son's bedrooms that I'm gonna be working on here, and I came across these prints, and I thought they were beautiful, but I thought, wow, that would be a really easy one to knock off. And they're originally $260 each because they're pretty massive pieces of art. Large pieces of art cost a lot of money, but I'm gonna help you out on this because I've done most of the work for you. I have designed the knockoffs and all you're gonna need to do is get them printed and buy a frame and call it a day. So if you like this knockoff, it's gonna be super easy for you. So I've done all the work. I went ahead and I used Canva. Canva is such a great graphic design software. This is not sponsored. I just use them for all of my graphic design. They have a free version. I actually use the upgraded pro version just because I use it quite a lot for my Etsy shop of my digital prints. If you haven't checked out my Etsy shop, I'd invite you to pop on by and check it out. I designed these prints on Canva. You find similar fonts and then you just kind of mimic what you see. How I went about printing them. I did it three different ways for you so you could kind of get an idea. This one I just printed out as an engineer print at Staples. It was $3.60 for this black and white engineer print and you can see the paper is really light but I think once we get it in the glass you're not going to be able to tell but I'm going to reserve my final judgment for just a minute on that. I did a colored engineer print at Staples and they actually called me and they kind of gave me a hard time but ultimately printed it for me but my recommendation is that you don't do it. It was about $5.50 to $6 for this print. The difference between that and this is so drastic I wouldn't recommend the colored engineer print but I recently discovered Walgreen photo Walgreens photo. <laughs> I printed this 24 by 36 inch print. Normally it's $30, but they had a 50% off coupon. I think that they have coupons pretty regularly at Walgreens. Totally worth it in my opinion to spend the 10 extra dollars to do that. All we're gonna do is take our prints and put it in a frame that I picked up at Walmart. Now, in the inspiration one, it kind of had a thinner matte frame and they did have have something at Walmart that was much thinner but it was a shiny black frame. I thought about getting it, it was $16. I was gonna take some chalkboard spray paint and just kind of matte it down so it would look more like the restoration hardware one but this frame was only $3 more so I decided to splurge and spend the extra $3 for a much nicer frame. So we're gonna just put it in the frame so when it's all said and done, I have $24 into this version because I did the black and white engineer print. You can see a little bit of puckering in the paper of the engineer print, so you may wanna consider splurging and having it printed at Walgreens like I do in the next one, but it's not that bad. The biggest expense was that very large 24 by 36 inch frame. Walmart was the very best price I could find on that. As for the darker print, because I decided to splurge on the nicer print from Walgreens, it came to $35. So that's a massive savings over the $260 versions from Restoration Hardware Team. Now, if you wanted to make this a much smaller version, this price would drop drastically. But I was trying to keep it as close to the original dimensions as possible. And buying that very large frame was very expensive. Our next high-end DIY is an awesome Gothic arch window similar in style to the ones that you'd see Joanna Gaines using in her designs. They're really fun. They can be really, really expensive. And I have designed this free printable that you can get, and I'll put the link in the description box below. And we're gonna be using this as a template. And obviously it's a little windy out here. <laughs> I believe it's 24 inches by 36. Let's get going on our project. So, I figured we could do this one of two ways. So funny. Okay, they stopped honking their horn. No! <laughs> this is gonna make a funny segment. Do you hear that? They really want somebody's attention. 
Oh goodness. Hopefully they're done. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Maybe they're done this time. I am going to take some spray glue and we are going to put some spray glue on our template and actually stick our template down to the board while we jigsaw it. So we'll just peel it off afterwards and then um, do a light sanding and we're gonna put paint on it. So I think that it's gonna be okay. Oh, and by the way, I'm using MDF. You could use any kind of plywood that you want for this project. It's scrap wood that I had around. So it was free to me. I always have scrap left over from my project so this is a really good way to use up scrap wood there's a breeze today this is going to hold this in place really good so i'm just going to take some spray glue and just spray it onto the wood we're just going to let this get tacky by letting it sit for 30 seconds kind of get rid of some of these bubbles and it's stuck down pretty good and i'm hoping that it will work out great and at least this way with the breeze that we've got going on this won't be flying all over the place so we're going to start out by switching this bit to a drill bit so we can drill a pilot hole for our saw blade to fit through all right so to do that all we're going to do is loosen this up and we can pull that out then we're going to want to make sure the hole is fully open we can stick that right into the hole right and then i kind of hold it in place and then i pull the trigger and kind of hold it tight and that will help it kind of tighten and then you just make sure it's good and tight and then there you go and we're ready to drill some pilot holes now we're going to start cutting so you want to make sure that you have protection for your eyes and so I always have my nice little safety glasses. Now, you may want to wear a face mask. I am in open air, there's a breeze. I think I'll be okay. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of tired of wearing face masks everywhere, but I would recommend wearing one. I'm living a little dangerously. Now we get to use our jigsaw. All you have to do is pull on the trigger. Yeah, we're powerful. <laughs> All we're gonna do is take our blade, stick it in one of these holes, and start cutting. Just keep cutting and keep cutting till we have all of the white space gone. Okay, so we've got one whole panel here, nice and clean. You can get a jigsaw starting around $30 or so. I've been using a $30 one for several years and it's been okay. Having said that, I recently upgraded to this one that I think I got on sale for around $50 and there was a tremendous difference in ease of use and quality of cut. So I would recommend spending at least that on a jigsaw. You can even go as high as $200, but this $50 one really did a great job. So you just start cutting in the jigsaw hole and then work your way over to the line and then cut along that line. When you get to the top of one of the points, stop. And then I lifted out my jigsaw and flipped the blade around and went back in the opposite direction and took it to the next corner. I kept repeating this process over and over until all of the white space was gone. With interruptions and filming, it took me about an hour and a half to cut this all out. So this is definitely a good afternoon project. Here it is. Isn't that just so awesome? Our template held up really, really well. So all we need to do is kind of just remove this. This can actually be the back if we need to, but I think we'll be able to get it all off. There's a couple like little spots that are a little bit of high point. So I've got my electric sander. Makes the job go faster. I love my power tools. <laughs> so we're just gonna go ahead and sand down some of the rough spots. Apparently 
Apparently I'm not the only one doing construction right now. So I hope you don't mind the noise in the background. And that's okay because I'm making noise for my neighbors. But we are done sanding and we've smoothed down some of those rough spots. I'm really happy with this. I think it looks fantastic. Now I want to show you what's going to take it over the edge to make it look more authentic and just more finished looking. So I picked up this PVC flat, I think it's trellis molding. And this whole eight foot section was $4. What's awesome about this is it bends. And so we are going to just nail some of this to the edge to finish it off. On a normal window, you would have some of this. And then I also had this left over from my shelf build. And so I'm gonna be putting this cause it's a little bit thicker and a little bit more sturdy on the bottom, but you could use this all the way around. So that's just up to you. But this way I can get away with just using one of these and then I can use this on the bottom. It's a little thicker, a little sturdier. It looks a little bit more like a window sill. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna very carefully and scientifically just make this touch the bottom and then we are just gonna go little by little to get our mark. And we're gonna just pinch that making it flat till we figure out where we want this. Then we're gonna take a pen and mark it. Now, if you don't have a miter saw, that's okay. You can definitely get away with cutting this with your jigsaw. I'm just gonna use my miter saw. I'm not gonna do a tutorial on that because I've done it on other episodes, but I'm gonna pull it out because it's gonna give me a nice clean cut and that's what I'm looking for. I've got an electric staple gun. What's nice about this is it also shoots brad nails and it takes all the hard work out of it for you. These are little tiny brad nails and they're gonna be perfect for what we're doing. You just slide those in there on the side and click it into place like that. All we're gonna do is drive those nails in and then we'll do the same thing to the other side and then we'll put on the bottom piece. my heck <laughs> I love this and this little detail right here is making all the difference now I'm gonna just take it inside and paint it To give it a little age, I just take a little sandpaper and scuff up the edges. When it's all said and done, I only spent the $4 on the trellis trim because I had everything else on hand. But if you were to recreate this look for yourself, you could definitely get the job done for under $20, maybe even less if you were able to find some free scrap wood. I couldn't be more thrilled with my end result. The next DIY that I have for you is we are going to be doing some wood candlesticks. Now, Joanna always goes out and has these wonderful artisans make her these things from scratch. And I'm sure that that is not cheap. So we're gonna fake the look. Shh, I won't tell if you don't tell. <laughs> and we are gonna use wood spindles. We're gonna just cut these in different varying sizes and lengths and then we will go from there and we'll just kind of see how it takes shape. So for my first length, I'm gonna cut it off right there, right at the edge of that. And then I'm gonna cut it at about 18 inches. So that will be right in there. It doesn't need to be exact. We're just kind of going for estimates. So I'm just gonna put a mark right here. So that looks pretty good. Now we're gonna take another one and we're gonna turn these into like some, some shorter ones. For this first one, we will cut it off right there. Okay. So we'll turn this one into two, make a mark. It doesn't need to be exact. 
And now for this third one, I am going to do maybe the same length as that, but it's much shorter, obviously. But we'll keep like this part the same for a little bit of consistency. Okay, so we've got these set of three different sizes. I picked these up at Hobby Lobby. They're regularly $2.99 for a set of four, and I make sure I get everything on 50% off sale or use a coupon. So we're gonna attach those to a base just so they're a little bit more sturdy. But I picked up this little bag of, it's called a wooden base. I don't know exactly what it is, but I got it at Michael's for super cheap. I didn't know what it was and I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I have to have it. Look at this. If we take this wooden base and set this on top of each one of these, upside down like that, it really looks like the top of a candlestick. I already had these on hand, but if you wanted a functioning candlestick, I would recommend picking up some wood candle cups. They have these at Michael's for such a great deal. The hole in that. That's the hole in the bottom, but I want to countersink it. I have a countersink bit around here somewhere, <laughs> but in a pinch, you can just use a bigger drill bit and just put it right on top of that hole. It's not as pretty of a countersink, but it'll get the job done. There we go, that's a better one. If you put it on reverse, that's what it looks like. <laughs> so that might be a good idea. Get it poking out the other side. Kind of start it by hand a little bit. Hey, that should be on there good. I just glue my decorative wood base upside down on top of my candlesticks using Gorilla wood glue and allow them fully to dry. Then I wanted to make them not look like pressure treated lumber and give them an aged look. So I took some antiquing glaze and I kind of dry brushed it on and then I took a wet paper towel and kind of wiped it down a little bit to wipe off some and smooth out some of the rough edges. I repeated this exact same process with white chalk paint over the top. The finished result totally looked aged and have this really cool patina on them. And if I ever decide to use them as an actual candlestick, I might switch out those tops with the candle cups. But all in all, I spent a total of $6 on all three candlesticks, and that's not too bad considering the Magnolia ones are over $20 a piece. We are gonna be making one of her pillows that she had in one of her Fixer Upper houses. And on the pillow, it had the lyrics to a really meaningful song to me, You Are My Sunshine. Now, this is something that I sing to my kids all the time. I just love this song and I thought it would be really fun to have it on a pillow. I just cut some heat transfer vinyl out on my Cricut machine in a gray color that I already had on hand. The font I used is called Calibri, making sure each line was about 16 and a half inches wide. And of course you peel back and get rid of the excess vinyl that is not needed. Then I separated my lines. My pillow is 18 inches so I measure a 19 and a half inch square and then cut that out. Then I cut a 19 and a half inch wide by 25 and a half inch rectangle and then I fold that in half and cut down the middle creating two pieces. You will see why in just a second. I set the heat on my easy press to 330 degrees. Now you can definitely get away with using a regular iron for this as well. I start by laying out the lyrics on my pillow, making sure I find center one first and then evenly space the rest from there. Thank you. 
I press it for about 30 seconds in sections, then I flip it over and do the back for an additional 15 seconds, and then I let it cool a bit, and then I check to see my progress. I do this two more times until the vinyl is really stuck down to that canvas. Then I peel it back. Okay, so I wanted to show you really quick how to make a simple envelope pillow. This is a really beginner sewing project, so this is a great place to start if you're a little nervous to sew. I've got our front, and it turned out really cute, right? But we're gonna set this aside for just a second. And I've got two pieces that are the same width as our original, but six inches longer, and I've cut it down the middle, so we've got two pieces. We're gonna start out by finishing off one edge on each one of these, and then what we're gonna do is pin it to our pillow, kind of overlapping each other, and it will just create a little pocket that we can slip a pillow into. Okay, so we're gonna just take one of the long edges and we're gonna just fold it back. If you wanna zigzag the edges, I'm never gonna tell you not to do that, but I'm not gonna do it just because I'm cheating. <laughs> you wanna back stitch and then you just want to do a straight stitch. And so there you go. And then we'll do that on the other piece. Here's our top. We're gonna do corner to corner. We're gonna lay this, match up the corners. And then we're gonna take our other one and overlap it, but make sure you match up the corners. And then you've created a pocket. And then we'll just sew this all together. And then you'll have a little space to put in your pillow. Make sure you angle cut your corners before flipping it. So all we need to do is flip this right side out now. And it's pretty easy to do because we've done this little envelope. And then just make sure you push out the corners. So there you can see our little pocket and we can put our pillow in through there and our cute little pillow cover. These were leftover supplies for me from other projects, but you probably have about $5 in supplies, plus the cost of a pillow if you don't have one on hand already. Well, I like to think that Joanna watches my channel, so Joanna, if you're watching, I hope I did you proud. So our next high-end knockoff, I'm gonna be knocking off a Pottery Barn Weston picture frame. For an eight by 10 of these frames, you would be looking at around $40 for one picture frame. And we are gonna do it for a fraction of the cost. I went to Dollar Tree and picked up these frames and I figured that they would work out okay. I don't really like the frame color, but we're gonna change all of that anyways. And I got thinking about all the different ways that I could assemble this and make sure that it was sturdy and not gonna fall apart. So here's what I came up with. At Dollar Tree, they sell this picture hanging kit, and inside are these little O hooks. And they're little tiny ones. And I think that it's small enough that we should be able to screw it in. Now, before I do, I'm gonna open it up just enough because I got these O-rings and I liked them because they were kind of substantial. Now, you could use these book rings that you can get at Dollar Tree. I know a lot of people use them for DIYs. They would work and they would be okay, but you do see the hinge and it just is a little bit thinner. So there is that as an option. It's an affordable option. I I just liked these O-rings because they were a lot beefier and at 75 cents, it was worth spending a little bit more in my opinion. So all we'll do is we'll take this little O hook and I'll take some needle nose pliers and open it up a little bit just so that we can have a spot to slip in that ring. So our hook would go in easier. I took the tiniest little drill bit I had and pre-drilled a tiny little hole for our O hook. You might be able to skip this step, but it sure did make it a whole lot easier. Then all we need to do is take our O ring, slide it inside the O hook, and pinch that hook down back into place so it is all now secure. Now, 
all the finishes are different. We've got brass, we've got nickel, we've got some kind of like antiqued gold, but that doesn't really matter because I'm just gonna take it outside and spray paint it in an oil rubbed bronze. Since the original is made out of iron, that is a pretty close match in look but probably not in feel. Ours is obviously a lot lighter. Once it's dry, I take a couple of prints from my Etsy shop and put those in for a decorative element in my bedroom. But I might switch those out for some family photos. You can put whatever you want in these picture frames. To hang these, I just use some command hooks that I spray painted to match. The only change that I would make to these frames, and I've actually already ordered them off of Amazon, is to use a three inch O-ring. I think the one I used was about an inch or an inch and a half. When you buy them in a pack of 10, they only end up being 25 cents more per O-ring and it will be a much closer match to the original version. When I switch out the larger O-ring, I might also do a more sturdy hook that actually screws into the wall because the larger O-ring will weigh more. But honestly, they're pretty cute as is. And at only $3, it saved us around $37 per frame for a near identical look. I am on my way to the Goodwill. I have driven 45 minutes to go to this Goodwill because I just have not had the best luck thrifting in my area. I'm hoping to find a bench today because we are knocking off a Pottery Barn bench and I'm gonna teach you how to do a slip cover. Wish me luck. I've been struggling to find a good thrift store here. If not, I've got a good backup and we will go with it on Facebook Marketplace. But I just wanted to see what I could find. I think I might have hit the mother load because it says Goodwill Outlet and I'm hoping that that means like some really deeply discounted stuff. I hope all of my thrifting dreams are about to come true. No dice. Uh, it was kind of the most different Goodwill I have ever been to. Everything was just in this giant bin. I mean, I guess that's why they call it an outlet. I have another idea, so I'm gonna give that a try and hopefully we'll have some luck. No dice. So now we're gonna try the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Okay, no luck at Habitat Restore. So I think it's time to go with the Facebook find. I should have just done that to begin with, but I'm really trying to find some good thrift stores and I just not. So we are back from our thrifting adventures and I still haven't found a good thrift store. So if you know good thrifting for furniture and home decor items in the greater Orlando area, hook a girl up. And I love thrifting, but we succeeded in the end and we found this off of the Facebook marketplace and I learned from that experience that if you find something that works, just go get it. In my case, I was just hoping to find some good thrifting along the way, which I didn't, but I did end up with a good bench. And this floral fabric is so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> when I was looking for a piece, I really wanted something that was about the same dimensions as the original, and this is that. It's a little bit narrower, not much, but other than that, the width and the height and all of that is good for what we're looking for. What we're gonna be doing is a slip cover. Doing a slip cover, especially on a bench like this, this is straight stitching. You can handle it, I promise, and I'm gonna show you how to do it. The first thing we're gonna do is this was tufted with just a couple of buttons, and we're gonna remove those in our inspiration piece it was smooth and I'm also gonna go ahead and try to remove this piping because I don't want it to be a bump in our slip covers now this part is completely optional you don't have to do this this is just my own personal preference because I think that there might be a little bit of indentations from where the buttons were I am just gonna add a layer of batting that I already had on hand that's left over from my dining room chair makeover if you haven't seen that episode I'll put the link in the description box below watch it afterwards I totally transformed my dining room chairs. That's another one if you're interested in reupholstery or slip covering. I wanted to show you the fabric that I got to match this one. I went into Joann's and I found this, which is pretty much spot on, honestly. It's a really good match. This is by Nate Burkus. It was regularly $19.99 a yard. And of course they have sales on their home decor fabric 
pretty much most of the time and this is 50% off so it was $9.99 a yard which is really good for home decor fabric which can really run you a lot of money so let's flip this over and see if we did a good job this is the moment of truth and I think we did so then what we're gonna do is you're gonna want to measure the top and I kind of already know that we're about 48 inches by and I think this is about 18 inches. Nope, 16. <laughs> so I'm gonna cut out it to be a little bit bigger because you wanna allow for kind of like a seam allowance. So I'm gonna cut it out to 49 by 17, which is not a ton, but I don't want it to be like uber big. So I kind of want it sitting on top. We want to measure the top to the ground. So after you have all of your measurements, I suggest adding about three quarters inch to each side for seam allowances. And since we are basically cutting out a bunch of rectangles, all you really need to do is add an inch and a half to all of your dimensions when you're cutting out your fabric. Since there's no curving pieces, it's pretty simple. But anytime I make a slip cover, I typically add about three quarter inch extra for all seam allowances. Since this is a stripe fabric, I try to center all of my stripes on the middle so that it balances out and is not off-centered. And then when you're doing a hem, I allot for about an inch for the hem on the bottom and three quarters for the seam allowance up top. This is really simple. You don't have to do any weird cuts. And then we'll do some end pieces to put underneath to um, for the corner so you don't see this floral fabric poking through because that wouldn't be very pretty. For those of you who are beginning to sewing or have never sewn before, this is actually a pretty easy project and I believe that you can do this. I do have a video, it's one of my few videos over on IGTV where I show you how to thread a machine, how to thread a bobbin, and also how to do a straight stitch. And I'll put the link to that in the description box below. So if you've never done that before, you can go over and refer to that video to get some basic sewing skills. We're going to start by doing a finished edge on all of the side pieces, leaving four and a half inches not sewn at the top where they will be attached to each other. Now, the proper way to do this is finish all the edges with zigzag or a serger. I don't do it a lot of times and I find it's okay. The problem is, is when you go to wash it, that's when you really have the issues. So I will tell you, you probably ought to do your finished edges with a zigzag, but I'm probably not going to. Don't judge. <laughs> because our piece is striped, and isn't it like looking so beautiful with my other stripes? It's not clashing at all. <laughs> Anyways, because it's striped, I want to be very careful about how I go about the piping. So that's what we're gonna do right now is work on the piping and make sure that it all lines up. So I cut my fabric to one and a half inch and then I'll put my piping inside and we'll sew a seam. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that all of our stripes line up and that when we go around back, that they will all be lined up. We'll cut this on the edges to match up with the stripes. We'll also make sure that the stripes line up with the side pieces as well. So we want all of the piping to line up stripe-wise with each of our pieces. So in order to do that, we just need to take a little bit more time than normally. Normally I say the piping doesn't matter all that much, but when you're doing stripes like this, it kind of matters. This will take a little bit extra time, but it will be totally worth it in the end. And it will make our knockoff all the more convincing. Because I was so concerned about making sure that the stripes matched up, I'm doing my piping a little bit different. So I wanted to tell you and show you kind of what I've got going on. First of all, I really like to use 5.30 seconds piping. I buy it in bulk um, off of Amazon because it's the cheapest that way. It ends up being like, I don't know, 25 cents a yard. So it's like ridiculously cheap and we're gonna end up needing oh, maybe three yards at the most. So that ends up being like 75 cents for our project, super cheap. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and lined up all of the stripes and you can see, and then I've already, sewn the seams together on the corners and I'm gonna just when I make my piping I'm gonna do it as I go and that way I know that my stripes are gonna match up a lot of times I'll just pre make a whole bunch of piping and just go to town because it doesn't really matter because there's a busy pattern or something like that because of the stripes I'm just gonna do it as I go and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my piping and we are gonna place it 
inside about right in the center right there and we are going to wrap our fabric around it and make sure that it's tucked right back in and then as we go we're going to just stitch it to the fabric stitch it right in place and then we will know our stripes will match up that's not normally how i do it but i think for this situation it's the best option I leave the first couple of inches of my piping unsewn until we get to the end and you'll see why. Also when I do the piping I use my zipper foot and we will pretty much be using this for the remainder of the project. This helps you get right up next to the piping without it pushing it out of the way. When you get to the corner leave the needle in the fabric, lift up the presser foot and turn the fabric and then replace the presser foot and sew again. When you get to the end, you are going to make sure that the piping is cut to where the corner is, but leave about an inch of extra fabric, which we will then fold back and wrap around the beginning piece. I did this on the corner this time, but normally I do not do that. I like to do it on the straight edge because it makes it a little bit easier, but doing this process gives it a much more finished feel instead of crisscrossing and cutting them off. It just looks better this way. So really funny, I had exactly the amount of thread in my bobbin to finish this. It ran out literally as we were finishing our piping. This is the hardest part, so now it's gonna be smooth sailing from here and we're gonna attach the skirt. Okay, so now we're gonna stitch each corner of the skirt together. Then after that, we're gonna put the corner flaps on to hide anything from the corners. <laughs> So the way I go about pinning the top to the sides is I always start at the corners. I always stick pins in my mouth. I know it's not the safest, but <laughs> it's how I do it. Don't do this at home. If my mom's watching, sorry. <laughs> I know you taught me better. <laughs> so I find the corner and I match it up to the seam and I put a pin there. And then I move to the center in our case, we have perfect places to put pins. We're just gonna put them at every stripe corner just to make sure that all of the stripes line up. So we'll just go ahead and get this all pinned up and then we're gonna sew it on. And then the last thing that we'll need to do is just hem it and it will be done. And we'll see how good of a knockoff I did. <laughs> Okay, so I wanna show you one boo-boo that happened. It's bound to happen. I've been sewing for 30 years, 30 plus <laughs> years, even with all of that experience under my belt. Things happen when you're working with a lot of different layers of fabric. So I'm gonna show you that. There's a boo-boo right here in the corner. And then there's one thing that I want to tweak that I want to get a little closer to the original. And that is just to tighten it up in the corner so it, it slightly pulls. Um, in the original, you'll notice that up on the corners, it kind of pulls in and is a little bit snug. I almost think it looks kind of like a mistake, you know, like it's pulling like a little too tight, tighter than it should. But for the sake of the dupe, we're gonna imitate it and go for that look as well. Okay, so you can kind of see right here that I puckered up and all what we'll do is we'll just kind of unpick this and we'll just redo this tiny section here. We don't need to redo the whole thing. We'll just rip open the seam here, smooth that out and fix that error. And here to get it to pull, we'll just tighten up the seam a little bit more so that it kind of pulls a little bit like the original. Instead of doing a traditional hem, I decide to use peel and stick fusing tape so you can't see any stitching. This seems to match the original the best. My hem ended up being one and a quarter inch and it's as easy as peeling and sticking the fuse tape to the fabric and pressing it on. So the advertised price on the website was $950, but I wanted to see the actual price once you included shipping. So I went through the checkout process and discovered that by the time you add shipping and tax and all of that, you're into it $1,170. And you're gonna have to wait six weeks to get it. As far as knockoffs are concerned, I feel like this is about as close as you can come. I ended up spending around $48, which is less than 5% of the original cost. And so for a 95% savings, that's pretty good. I, I don't know that it, I could stomach forking over all of that extra cash. For my 
my project today, I am going to be knocking off a designer item. This time it's from Ballard Designs. I found a beautiful chandelier that was $529 and I really loved it, but I wanted to see if I can do it for a lot less. I'm gonna be using some really interesting items. I think you might even actually question my sanity a little bit when I, I pull out some of the items, but that's what you gotta do is you gotta get creative. You gotta think outside of the box, but I promise you that they're gonna work and it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna show you three interesting things that I'm using. The first is I'm gonna be using some cookie sheets from the Dollar Tree. I think they're gonna really work for a part of our project. And then I'm using three of these six foot dog tie out cables. So like a dog chain from the Dollar Tree again. And then finally, and this is a little bit odd, I am using eight tuna cans, like empty tuna cans. So we've had a lot of tuna sandwiches recently. Okay, so we're gonna start by building the frame of the chandelier first. And I picked up three of these 36 inch long, one and a half by one and a half inch poplar pieces of lumber from Home Depot. But we are gonna keep two of them, the original length, and then we are gonna take the third one and cut it directly in half. We're gonna just go ahead and mark that and make that cut now. So a couple quick safety tips. Normally I have some clear protective eyewear for my saw. I couldn't find them, so we're gonna make do with my sunglasses, but that's just to prevent any sawdust from getting in your eyes. In between each use, I always unplug it because I have little people around and I just don't want them accidentally, you know, turning it on like that and hurting themselves even if I'm gonna only be away from it for just a second. We're gonna be building the frame for the chandelier. I didn't want anything exposed like in the way of nails or anything on the ends. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna insert dowels inside the joint to keep it all nice and put together. We're gonna take the one of the long ones and we are going to Take a nail and put it in about the center. Tap it into place, make sure it's nice and level. And then you take some wire clippers and you clip off the head of the nail so then it's kind of sharp. And then we're gonna line it up on this table. And then we take our hammer and tap it into place. And what that's gonna do is make a mark where your starting hole should be. And then we can just take this nail and pull it out. So now you've got a, a starting point for each joint. Drill nice and straight. And then we do the same thing to this. So roughly this is gonna work. We're probably gonna need to do a little sanding around the joints, but that's okay. Before we glue this together and finalize it, then you're just gonna add some wood glue in the holes and if a little bit gets through, that's okay because then it will help strengthen that joint. For a much tighter joint, I highly recommend using a clamp. So I've let my frame dry overnight, so I'm gonna take off the clamp now. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sand the frame because we want a nice um, smooth surface. Using a sander makes it so much faster. <laughs> So I decided to move the party inside um, because I didn't know how the humidity and heat would work with the stains. I'm doing it in our guest bathroom because this is an area that is not getting used right now and then I can also turn on the fans for circulation and all of that. I'm gonna put on some gloves to protect my fancy manicure that I still don't have. <laughs> no, I'm just doing this because it's gonna get messy and I don't want to have a stain all over my hands. And then I've got a cast off sock that its partner probably got eaten by my dryer, like so many socks do. Just gonna dunk my hand in the stain and I'm just using a gel stain because I thought it would work a little bit better and give us a nice thick coat. And that is going on very dark, which is kind of good because that's kind of what 
I wanted. The next step in the process is creating the iron strapping that was on the wood frame. And you're gonna need protective gloves for this step because you're gonna be exposed to some sharp edges and it's really important to protect your hands so you don't get cuts. They're not very expensive at all and definitely worth it. Then you're gonna take your tin snips and cut off the lip of the cookie sheet, leaving just the bottom part. Then you're gonna take that part and cut two and a half inch strips. Then you are ready to spray paint, which we will just spray paint all of the tuna cans. Anything that's gonna be metal, we're gonna use the leftover spray paint from my project last week and spray everything a nice flat iron looking black. So I've let everything dry for several hours and hopefully it is all dry enough to do my next step. We're gonna start with the iron, the iron, <laughs> the pretend iron um, strapping that was made from cookie sheets and we've sprayed it in that um, outdoor flashing that black is I'm going to start on the inside so the rough side is right underneath the tuna can <laughs> tuna can oh my goodness and so we're going to just fold it around and get it on there and it should just bend really nicely and then we're going to put a little pressure and pull it up and bend it all the way around and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a little mark here and then i'm going to grab my tin snips that i left inside so i'm going to go grab those and i'm going to take this off we are going to trim it to fit to kind of keep everything in place I'm going to take my tuna can and I've kind of punched a little hole in this, set this on top. So I'm going to drill a pilot. So that is set. Then I'm going to switch my tip to a traditional tip. I'm just using drywall screws. I had them on hand. You could probably use whatever you want. And then we are going to screw this right into place. Look at that. So that is on there good. That will help the fake iron strap to stay in place good. And we'll do that all the way along. So you can see right here, I have a little bit of an issue and I did know that this was gonna happen. And what it is, is it's just where this seam is meeting up. And I've got some, you know, E6000 on there, but it doesn't wanna stay down because it wants to bend out. So my solution for this, and it's also kind of an aesthetic thing as well, on the um, original, there's some nail heads. And I just am going to, I took these thumbtacks and I sprayed them the same color. So I pressed those in and not only does that hold it into place, but it adds kind of an aesthetic as well. So, and anywhere that I'm scratching on this ironwork, I'm planning on going back in and touching up. Next, I drill pilot holes into the wooden round in a square shape for the hooks that will hold the chain supports. Then I place another thumbtack in the center for an added decorative touch. So on the edges, I've come in two and a half by three quarters. We're gonna pre-drill the screws for the hooks where we're gonna attach our cables. All right, so I'm getting ready to hang my light fixture and I had my husband come out earlier and help me mark where we were gonna need to put it because it was kind of a two person job because we had to kind of center it in between the two light fixtures, as you can see. Um, and apparently he did not want me to miss where he marked. So I need to determine whether or not there's a stud up there so i'm going to use a stud finder that would be most ideal because obviously that would be the most secure um, if not i do have a toggle that i can put into the drywall which would support up to 50 pounds worth of weight which should be more than plenty because my light fixture is nowhere near that um, so let's go see if there's a stud there's a stud in my house let's see if there's a stud up there no stud <laughs> all right so we're going to be using the toggle 
So I wanted to show you before I hung it that I attached the cables to the hooks right here and over here. And so on all corners. And then I connected it right there as well. So my project is done, it's hung. I am so thrilled with how it turned out. I feel like it's a really good dupe and a really good knockoff of the Valor design. My version came in at around $60. There is a way to do it for about half the cost and that would include switching out the candles for some from the Dollar Tree. This is the Dollar Tree version and this is my version. Now, the reason I went with these candles is because the Dollar Tree one, you would have to manually turn on each and every time you use it. You have to get up and, and switch that out. My version, you actually can turn on with a remote and off with a remote, so it's really cool. They're a little bit beefier. I'm really glad I spent the extra money, but if you're looking for a little bit more budget-friendly solution, switch out for the Dollar Tree candles. I'm going to be knocking off this Pottery Barn craft table and we're gonna be doing it for around 10% of the cost. Plus I'm spilling the beans on a dirty little secret. I promise to share with you a dirty little secret. All right, don't judge. <laughs> I didn't even clean up for you, but I wanted to be real and authentic with you and really illustrate why I really need to redo this room. This room you can see is right at the top of our stairs. It's the loft room. It's meant to be used as a family room and it's going to be my craft room slash workspace. And you are going to be seeing a lot of my tutorials in this room right now. This is what it looks like. <laughs> Look. My new Cricut machine is on the floor. That is bad. That's not where it should be going. I've got stacks of books, a desk that I never use. It's just not functional. I think it was built for a kid. Do you still love me? So we're gonna build the Pottery Barn craft table. We're gonna build it right here and I've got some tips and tricks, so let's get started. We are gonna start out by building these cubby organizers. I got mine from Target. You can find them at Walmart. You can really find them all over. And if you're lucky, you can find one already pre-built, maybe like on the Facebook Marketplace or something like that. If you're lucky enough for that, you can skip a bunch of these steps. I'm gonna build these for you, show you how it's done, show you that we can do it. <laughs> And then I'll also provide some links below if you need to locate some for this project. So on the Pottery Barn version, I noticed that's really all the base was, was two 36 by 36 inch shelves with cubby space. I'm like, that's easy. So this bottom part, we're just gonna put together with pre-built stuff. And then we're gonna take a trip to Home Depot and get a couple of supplies for the tabletop. P.S. I love knocking off things because I love being able to get that designer look for less and not forking over all the cash. I am always looking for things to knock off, things that you wanna see me do. So hit me up in the comment section below with certain brands and items that you wanna see me knock off and I'll see what I can do. Okay, so we're gonna break this out of the box and put it together. Now, we're gonna actually follow the directions. They make them for a reason. So we're really gonna go step by step through those instructions and we're gonna build a shelf. So our two shelves are done. The first one took a little bit longer, but it was really not that long. And then the second one went in probably half the time because we knew what we were doing that time around. Now I used a drill in the instructions that said to go ahead and use a Phillips screwdriver. You can do what you want, but using the drill definitely made the job go much faster. So now it's time to build our top for our craft table. And for that, we're gonna need to take a trip to Home Depot. I always get distracted. Look, Christmas trees. They also have Halloween stuff, so 
from Halloween to Christmas, they got you covered. All right, here is the section that we need. I am needing some sort of plywood. I'm kind of thinking MDF, but I gotta see what they've got here. Okay, so I know that this is a girls can use power tools challenge, but I am gonna have them cut down my sheets because I don't have a table saw. And we're still using power tools in this, but if you don't have a table saw, go ahead and have them cut it down. Or if you're just nervous, have them make some cuts for you. All right, I am back from the home improvement store and this is where you are gonna have some decisions to make for yourself. I am trying to knock off the Bedford project table as closely as possible and I've thought about a lot of different ways how to go about this and so I have a plan. If you wanna build just these cubby shelves and slap a piece of wood on top of it, screw it down, paint it, and call it a day, this would be sufficient to do some crafting on. So that's gonna be your call. But again, we are trying to knock off the Pottery Barn version and we're gonna get that as close as possible. Also, the way that we're gonna go about it is gonna make it a little bit more stable, a little bit more sturdy, and that's never a bad thing. What we're gonna do is we've got to make this top a little bit thicker, a little bit more stable. And then as you can see, I've got some panels on the inside. What it came with for the cubbies, were five of these cardboard pieces that they folded in half and there's one for every other one. You don't have to put anything on the back if you don't want to, but it does leave an unfinished edge on the inside and I'm not okay with that and plus, the original version also has an, the back entirely filled in. So I just picked up some inexpensive plywood at the store. It was like $11 for a huge sheet. I've got tons of leftovers from both the MDF and the thinner veneer. So if you're doing this project with me, hang on to those pieces because you know I'm gonna do something with the scraps. Before I attach them, I am gonna paint at least one side of them because these white shelves are already painted and so we're gonna take care of that prior to attaching them. In order to make our table more sturdy, I'm using some two by fours to build kind of like a frame and I'm not doing it upright, but I'm doing it flat. Now, because we don't wanna see butt joints, we are going to be doing some miter cuts. Remember, if you're working with a saw, make sure you cover your eyes with some protective eyewear. Make sure you're calm, cool, and collected. It's not that hard, we can do this. After you know that your first cut is great, then you can go ahead and use that as your pattern for your next one. It makes the job quicker and then you know that they're precise and that they're gonna match up. So I've got my frame clamped to the table topper. We're gonna screw it to the top from the underside. The way we're gonna do this is we're going to pre-drill for our screws. And then what we're gonna do is take a larger screw and we're gonna just screw in just a hair just so we can countersink our screws. All right, so we'll put in our larger bit. And then we'll go right where we pre-drilled those holes and just barely go down just so you can countersink the screw. Perfect. You don't have to do much, just enough to get it down a little bit because the last thing we want is for our screw to go all the way through. Definitely what we don't want to do. All right, perfect. So we've got the frame screwed on and now we can flip it over, see how it looks, and then we're gonna do some spackling just to make sure it's nice and smooth. We'll sand that down. Then we'll paint it up and then we'll attach it to the bottom shelves. All right, so everything is now painted and now it's time for finishing touches. So I've pre-painted the back, so now we're gonna nail them on. You could just take a hammer and nails and use the nails that came in with the shelves. I've got a nail gun and it just always makes the job so much easier. So I'm gonna be using this. And so just make sure that everything is lined up and looking good. I love my nail gun because this is going to be easy. Oh! 
<laughs> All right, so you can see that I have everything flipped over and I've created about an inch lip all the way around. So now we're gonna pre-drill some holes into our shelf so that we can put screws right into the top. Because this is kind of a slippery surface, this laminate, we're gonna use some painter's tape just so that it has something to grip to as well as prevent some of that chipping that can happen. So the final step is just to install two support brackets on either side. This is something that's on the original and just will add a little bit of more stability between the two bookcases. So I'm just gonna actually just drive some screws into them on either side and then we'll do some touch up paint and I'll do the reveal. All right, our craft table is done and I am sitting on it just to show you how sturdy it is. So this is something that you can do even if you're a beginner. It just takes some simple skills that hopefully you gained by watching this tutorial. So you could go and buy the Pottery Barn one for $1,300 or you could build this one for around $120 and save over 90% and keep a little cash to yourself. But I am extremely happy with this one. So I love looking at Pinterest along with the rest of the world and I have noticed all of these massive farmhouse kind of rustic signs that are kind of blacks and whites and have like rust spots on them and they are so great. I love them but they're pretty expensive. So with the help of my Cricut machine, we can do that for a fraction of the cost, but we're gonna have to take a quick hop outside to get this project started, so I'll meet you out there. I'm braving some heat and humidity here in Florida to do this project, <laughs> but we'll be okay. So here's my piece right here that we're gonna be making the sign out of. You can't even see me now, because it's such a big sign. This is 24 inches by 48 inches. This is just a scrap piece left over. I think it might be like the last of my scraps from my craft table build. Now, you'll notice that it's kind of thin, so I want to build a frame for that. Now, you could just use like a 3 quarter inch plywood piece, but I think that this is actually a little bit better because it, it will be a little lighter in the end. We're going to make it look beefier by taking one of these, I think this is called like common boards, it's like a one by two, and they do sell something similar to this for a dollar for an eight foot piece. It's really rough and warped a lot of the times. This one's two dollars, I recommend spending the extra dollar these are typically much straighter, less knot, less roughness, so this is um, a better way to go. I have two of them. This should be good for the top and bottom, and then we need another one for the sides. So we're just gonna go ahead and cut this on my miter saw just because it's gonna make it a much faster process. But you don't need that. You could use a circular saw, jigsaw, or even like a miter box, like a hand saw, if that's what you have, because these are pretty easy cuts. I'm not gonna do a tutorial on how to use this miter saw in this episode, because because I've done it on other episodes. But basically we need to cut these down to size to build a frame essentially or a backer for our piece of wood. So we're gonna measure, we're gonna cut the side panels first. And that's 24 inches. So then we're just gonna measure 24 inches, make our mark, if we can find our pencil. There it is. <laughs> There we go. All right, before we make our cut, we gotta make sure we put on our safety glasses to protect our eyes. And if you wanna wear a face mask, feel free to do that. I'm in open air and I feel okay about cut making these simple cuts without one. But I always recommend wearing one, if, especially if you have any issues with your lungs. So before we cut to the top pieces, I'm gonna place our side pieces so we can know exactly how to measure them. So we're just gonna line these up, make sure they're gonna work. I'm 
Now we can measure it and we have 45 and an eighth. And we'll make that cut. All right, so normally I would finish building this outside, but I will admit I'm being kind of a wimp and it's a little hot outside. <laughs> so I just decided to bring it inside and we are just gonna assemble this together. And I'm gonna use some little clamps to hold it in place while we take our electric staple gun, which actually also has a brad nail feature on it, which is perfect for what we're doing. It's really simple to use. And what's really nice about it is you just squeeze a trigger instead of having to swing a hammer and nails and maybe hit your fingers. We're going to start out by laying out our frame how we cut it and placing our large piece of wood on top because we will be driving our brad nails from the front side. Once everything is nicely lined up and clamped into place make sure you hold your electric brad nailer firmly into place and pull the trigger placing many nails all the way around. So we've got the frame on the back so it's much sturdier and then you can't see me. No, you can't. Peek a bit. Just kidding. We are ready to just get this all painted up and then work on our stencil. Now you could choose to fill these nail holes if you wanted to, but due to the rustic nature of this sign, I didn't feel like it was necessary. Then I just take some leftover white oops paint that I already had on hand and painted the whole thing white. Now it's time to design our sign. And for that, we need to go into Cricut Design Studio. Now I will be using my Cricut Explore Air 2 to make this sign, but you could definitely use a Cricut Maker as well. I just had my maker set up for something else and I just didn't want to mess around with it this time. So this part of the project is where your creativity comes into play. I know that I wanted to put the Callahan family established in 2007 on the sign. So I start out with the and put that in Times New Roman. I approximately place this in the center, but we're going to be messing around with it, so we don't really need to be exact at this point. Then I typed our last name, Callahan, and I ultimately decided to go with Rostilla for the font. Now we need to play around with the font to re really give it a very custom look. So all we do is we're going to go in and click the drop down menu under advanced and then we click ungroup letters. This way we can treat each letter separately changing the size and the placement. I make the largest letter, which is the C, and then I'm going to leave all the A's the same size, and then I'm going to increase the size of the L's, H, and N, and then I'm just going to place them where I like as I go. Then when I'm happy with the way it looks, for convenience purposes, we are going to go ahead and highlight all of the letters in my last name and attach them together. That way we can just move it around and adjust it as we need. Now we need to make lines for either side of the word, the, and family. And we do this by clicking on the square shape. And then on the bottom left hand corner, there's a little lock. We're going to unlock so that we can make it into not a square, but we can turn it into a line. Before I could get the lines correct, I needed to make sure I was happy with the way Callahan looked. And I decided that I wasn't, and I wanted to widen it a bit and stretch it out. And you can do it the same way you would do it with a shape, which is unlocking it on the bottom left-hand corner. Then you can make it taller or wider and stretch it out however you want. Getting the lines right actually took me quite a bit of time, but ultimately what you need to do is to get the line where you want it in width and thickness. And then you're gonna take another square, go just larger than the size of the word, and then you're going to set that square on top over the line where the word will sit. Then you're going to highlight everything and then we're going to hit the slice button. Now we can get rid of that middle excess by highlighting it and hitting the red X. Now you have the perfect spot for your word to fit in. Keep playing around with it until you're happy with the way it looks.
And then what you're going to want to do in order to create a stencil is to highlight the entire image and hit weld. Because our sign is going to need to be very large, we need to separate it into four individual stencils. We do this by putting four rectangles that fit on a 12 by 24 inch mat behind the image that ends up being 11 and a half by 23 and a half and highlighting each rectangle and hitting the slice button until you have four equal stencils. Then we can hit make it and make sure that it's set to the correct mat size and vinyl settings. And now we're going to cut out our vinyl on our Cricut Explore Air 2. I believe this is the best machine for most DIYers and crafters. It has so much versatility. It can cut over 100 materials, cuts everything from paper to iron on vinyl and bonded fabric and the removable vinyl that we are using today. I'm always surprised how much I use it and if you like to decorate and craft it really does pay for itself over time. So once we have our vinyl on our green mat then we are ready to load it into the machine by hitting the arrow buttons and then we hit C for cut or Cricut. We will do this four more times for each section. Now, I might have done something wrong here, so if you have any suggestions for this next part, let me know. But because it was so large, we needed to slice it into the four sections. And because it won't cut up to the edge, we have a little strip of vinyl that we don't need in between each section. So I used a straight edge blade to cut this part off, but thinking back, I probably could have just easily cut it off with scissors or done something to make it cut along those letter edges. So if you have an idea or know how to do this, let me know in the comment section below. Then we just weed out what we don't want and apply transfer tape and make sure you rub the transfer tape onto the vinyl securely. Then we just peel back our vinyl lettering and apply it to our wood canvas. Now I start in the center to make sure that that the words and everything are nice and centered. Once we've got it applied, we are ready to go outside and spray paint. But I've got a little trick that I wanna show you that may take you by surprise. So we need our sign to be rustic looking. We are going to spray paint it in this flat black spray paint. And then I'm gonna make it look a little rusty and I'm gonna do that by using some cinnamon. I know, hopefully it makes it smell good after everything dries. <laughs> I don't know, but rust kind of has this color right here. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of sprinkle this on as I spray paint. If I don't like something, I'll spray a little bit over it to kind of even it out. And so you'll just have to kind of watch what I'm doing. I've never done this before, but I'm hoping that it works and we'll see how it goes. All right, I gotta be honest right now, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about the cinnamon and the spray paint. I'm hopeful, but I just don't know. <laughs> so we're gonna let this dry. This is the thing with DIYing. I've never used this technique before, so it's kind of fun to try things new. Now that it's dry, we are going to peel off the vinyl and expose our white lettering. When I see the results, I am very pleased. There were a couple of spots where I didn't get the vinyl lettering quite matched up perfectly, but that's okay. I just go back in with a paintbrush and hit it with that original white paint. Now to seal the cinnamon, just so it doesn't flake everywhere, I spray it with a flat clear coat. I really didn't feel like a shiny polyurethane would have worked for this sign. Now even with this clear coat, you can still smell the cinnamon, which is awesome in my opinion. 
Before we can hang it, we need to put some hooks on and I simply just screw those into the back of the frame and now it's time to hang. I hope this project inspires you and shows you just how easy it is to use a Cricut to make amazing artwork and home decor. I have less than $10 in supplies on this project due to the scrap wood. If you are going to go out and buy this sign in similar dimensions, you can expect to pay between two and $300 easy. Or you could just take that money and buy a Cricut Explore Air 2 and be able to use it to make this project and so many others. So today's do, I went over to Pottery Barn and on the Mother's Day list there was a monogrammed Lazy Susan tray that was kind of a, like a wine barrel top. I'm like, that would be really fun. Not only would that be really fun to have, but that would make a really good dupe. I knew from the get-go the monogram would be probably the biggest hurdle to overcome. I knew that no matter what I did, I would probably have to make the monogram darker than the original. And that was okay because I could still get definitely the essence of it. But I didn't realize like what a challenge that would be. And I did a lot of homework for you guys to save you some, some trouble. So I have this little sample piece of wood just to show you, give you an idea of all the little different ways. Because I wanted to give you guys the, the easiest method with the best result that was like something really user friendly that you could do without a lot of headache and hassle. This is actually my first attempt. My first idea was wood burning. You're going to need to practice a little bit better to get um, a really awesome result. So I'm going to keep working on that one and, and maybe even get a nicer wood burner. I tried so many different methods, but the method that I came up with and the method that I'm going to recommend to you is awesome. I'm so excited. I really think that it's going to have a great result. So what it entails, and oh, I'm going to link the funniest tutorial. It was hilarious that I watched on this technique. It was like this guy, I don't even remember What's his name? So the first thing you need to do is design your monogram. I went to Canva and created it. I think it's Times New Roman font. It's like the identical font that Pottery Barn uses. And I got it about the size that I want. Then what you need to do is reverse the image so when it prints out, it prints out reversed of what you need. The trick here is you need to get shipping labels or some kind of Avery paper label. You pull off all of the stickers and all of it, so you, all you're left with is the wax paper itself. There's people who do the wax paper technique. For me, I found it, it was too flimsy, and when I fed it through the printer, it just kind of ate it up. So that did not work for me, and I would not recommend that. The next step is if you have a laser printer at home, you can do this at home. I went to Staples, and I gave them my paper. They were so nice. My local staples here were so nice and so helpful. And you get an image that looks like that. So I'm gonna cut mine down smaller. I want it to run kind of with the grain and I'm taking into consideration that there are handles on the side. Okay, so this looks to be pretty centered and what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm gonna just kind of hold this down and make a couple just very subtle pencil marks that I'm gonna go back in and erase later. You probably can't see that on camera, but I can kind of see where the pencil markings are and that will just give me an idea of where to place the, the medium that I'm gonna be using. Now the medium I'm going to be using is Liquitex Matte Gel Medium. You've seen me use Mod Podge in some of my other tutorials. I'm a big fan of Mod Podge. Mod Podge has an image transfer um, product. I did not like it, at least for this application. It would make the paper stick really bad and I just I just wasn't a fan. The best results I've got, and I did a lot of research on it, was this Liquitex product. I got mine off of Amazon. Such a good product. I love it. Um, and that's what we're going to be using. I got kind of a, I think it's like a one inch craft brush. You want it to be in good condition. You don't want it to be beat up. So we're going to take our medium. We're going to be kind of generous with it at first. 
And we're gonna get it into the area that we've marked here. And I actually kind of go both directions, um, just so it gets really worked into the wood. This is too much, we can't leave it like this. So now we're gonna go with the grain of the wood and kind of remove some of this. So we're left with a nice, smooth base for our monogram. Set that aside and then we're gonna take our monogram and line it up again. And you don't wanna wiggle this around too much. You wanna kinda set it down and then once it's down, rub it in, not too hard, but with enough pressure that it sticks. And then as this dries, we're gonna wanna come and check back to make sure there's no wrinkling or anything, and if so, kind of smooth that out. We're gonna let that sit for about two hours so I've set the tray aside while the image transfer dries and sets up. And I think I forgot to mention where I got the tray. I got the tray at Hobby Lobby. It was 40% off for $24. It was beautiful, it was big, it was sturdy, the color of the wood was beautiful, and I knew that that would be a really good match for our project. So the original was actually a Lazy Susan, and I'll get to that part later. Um, I know that that's a tray, but we are making it into a Lazy Susan. Now, I needed to solve the problem of the metal edge banding. So I went into my local Home Depot. I brought my picture with me. I kind of went searching for some kind of metal strapping. I thought I would find something there that would work. And I was right. I found several things that I thought would work. There was a section of just metal strapping that was very similar. But then when I showed it to a certain Home Depot worker, he's like, I know the perfect thing for that. And he's like, our pallets come attached in galvanized steel that was very similar to that. He's like, I cut that off every day and I'll just give you some for free. I was like, free? Sweet! So this is free. Um, you can buy some metal strapping if you'd like or go into your local Home Depot, kind of tell them what this is. Tell them they get it off of the pallets and see if they'll give it to you for free. Now the only problem is when he told me about it, I didn't realize that it was going to have all these kinks in it. So what I have decided to do, because there's just no way to flatten those kinks out, so what I am doing is there's these little bit longer sections that are maybe like six to eight inches. And I am just gonna take some um, tin snips and cut very carefully and try to do it as straight as possible with my tin snips. And I'm just gonna cut um, these little sections out and we'll just put them side by side all the way around the tray and I think it will look just fine and it will definitely serve our needs. So we're going to need about eight of these middle pieces to go around my tray because I'm leaving the handles exposed. If you wanted to cover those up then you would need about ten. So we could leave them as is, they're kind of cool the way they are, um, but to be true to duping it as close as possible, I'm going to do a little glaze over the top of mine, and all I've done is taken some leftover black paint that I had from my front door. You could use craft paint or whatever you have on hand, and I've watered it down because I'm just going to do a light glaze over it. You don't need that much. But we're really going to just wipe it on just the one side that's going to be exposed and then take a paper towel and dab it off. You can leave a little bit of the paint to kind of just give it an aged patina, but it's just as simple as that. Okay, so our metal is dried and so is our monogram, so I am ready to Pull this back and reveal the monogram and cross your fingers and hope that everything went well and that it looks good. So everybody hold your breath right now. 
All right. The moment of truth. Hopefully we made Craft Daddy proud. I'm gonna pull it up very slowly. Oh, I've got this upside down. I'm gonna rotate this so we can see it the right way. So far, so good though. Very slowly. I think we did it. DIY wood polish that I'm doing over on my IGTV channel that works with this that I'm going to be using on this and I'll put that over the entire thing so it should smooth it out and have a nice even finish on the entire tray. So my original plan was to screw these metal edge banding on but the metal's too thick it's too dense and it's just not gonna work. So, new plan. <laughs> We're gonna line it up in the middle and I am gonna just glue it down with some E6000 and take some little clamps that I got from the dollar store to kind of hold it in place and it will be fine. <laughs> I am so excited and stoked about how this is going so far. It's been 24 hours. Our edge banding has dried with the E6000. And even though we didn't end up using the first technique, I thought that's the way DIY goes, is you have to think outside the box. You have to be able to problem solve. We have a few of those seams butted up against each other. And honestly, it's probably fine to leave it like that, but I thought it would look a little bit more finished if we took a thumbtack, which I just had in my house, several thumbtacks, and put a little bit of that watered down black just to also give it kind of that aged patina, and we're just gonna push them in in between the seams. Honestly, if you wanted to stop the project right here and call it good, you could just have a serving tray. But we are duping the Lazy Susan version over on Pottery Barn, so we're gonna turn ours into a Lazy Susan. How I'm going to do that is I ordered a Lazy Susan off of Amazon. We are going to attach this to the bottom and we're just gonna screw it on. I've got some, so this part was like six bucks, six or eight bucks, I don't remember. And I've got four half inch screws and we're just gonna attach this with screws. Okay. It works! Look at that! We did it! Okay, so we now have a Lazy Susan. These edges are kind of sharp and we don't want it to scratch up our wood surfaces if we were ever to put it on a wood table or something else that could scratch. So I just cut out a black piece of felt and we're going to just hot glue that down and then we've got protection for our wood table. This is a pretty good dupe. I don't know, what do you think? Let me know in the comments if you think this is a good dupe. I'm going to be doing a knockoff of a Magnolia Home cake stand and I'm actually gonna make two of them so we can do a tiered effect. And I'm gonna make it two different ways and you'll see why in a minute um, because I wanted to give you two options. I thought it might be fun to see if I could re create the same look on a tight budget for those of you who may not be able to splurge on a Magnolia Home decor piece. So I popped on over to their website and I found these really adorable cake stands. I decided to knock off this one because I really liked the scalloped edge. I liked the, the metal versus the wood and I thought it would be a really fun project to see if I could get the look for less and I think that we can. So we're gonna do this two ways. If you look at the edge detailing on the original piece, it's actually made, I believe, from plywood because you can actually see kind of the layer 
layering effect on the edge of the cake stand. By me doing it this way, the larger one, I think it's gonna actually end up being a little bit more authentic to the original. If you have some plywood lying around, this will be the less expensive option. So I had some scrap woods left over from building my bench, and this is one of the pieces, and I'm actually gonna use up pretty much every last drop of my plywood over the course of the next couple of tutorials. I'm actually gonna cut two and you'll see why. So I measured and found some bowls in my house. So look around, you might find the right thing and that will help you get a perfect circle. So we're gonna go out and cut this out with our jigsaw, but I'm going to work slowly. And then if we have any rough spots, I'm gonna just sand those down. That is for somebody who has a jigsaw, maybe has some plywood sitting around or can get their hands on something. Thing. For those of you who don't and are a little intimidated by using a jigsaw, I have not forgotten you, and we're gonna use a pre-cut round. So each of them has their kind of pros and cons, and I'll go over that as we go. Now, let's go cut out our circle. Our circle turned out pretty good. There are a couple of like rough spots. So now I'm gonna take my electric sander and sand it all down nice and smooth, and then also do a good sanding on the top. So I've got my two circles cut out and sanded down. This one is my top one, and so I was a little bit more particular with this one. It looks pretty darn good, in my opinion. And then I cut out a second circle. This is about a half inch smaller than this one. We are gonna be gluing this to the top one, and then we are going to be doing that scalloped edge detail. I thought that that would make the scalloped edge detail so much easier to apply on this one. And so that's why we have two circles. This is the underside of the top piece. And we're gonna put both rough sides together. We're going to attach this to the top. So first of all, we're gonna put on our trusty E6000. And this is really good. We're gonna use this again, so keep it close by. And then just for some immediate stick, we're gonna put on some hot glue. Then we are going to flip this over and we are gonna just make sure that it is centered. This is a candlestick that I got at Michael's. We're gonna find center on this. Trace it so we know where it goes. And then we're gonna do the same thing with the E6000. I thought about using nails and stuff, but I think we're gonna be okay with this. And some hot glue for immediate stick. Flip it over and squeeze it down and put it right where it's supposed to be. All right, that actually, <laughs> I'm surprised how good that sticks. So now we have a cake stand, which I'm actually pretty excited about. It looks really good. We need the really adorable kind of metal scalloped edging. So this is my very affordable, and hopefully it's gonna work out. I have a good feeling about it. I picked up some tongue depressors. You can get these at the Dollar Tree. You can get them pretty much at any craft store. We are gonna make the scalloped edge out of popsicle sticks. I'm actually really quite excited about this. So I've decided to apply these first and then paint them after. And we are going to measure one inch and make a mark. And what's cool about these tongue depressors is you can take a cheap pair of scissors and just cut them. Instead of having to use a saw, you can use a saw. And so then you can see there will be our scallop and that will look really cute. I'm gonna do a whole bunch, a total of 48, but I'm gonna cut 24 of these. So we've got a pile of tongue depressors cut out for our scalloped edge. I'm gonna use a little bit of E6000 and a little bit of hot glue to attach them. We're gonna make sure we do the smooth side out and just a little bit at the top and then a little dab of hot glue for some instant stick right underneath that lip and hold it down. And then we're gonna just go all the way around. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so I finished applying my scalloped edge and overall I'm really happy with it. I'm gonna set it aside for a second and let it set up a little bit longer. But then I'm gonna take some spackling and I'm just gonna kind of fill in the gaps a little bit and then we'll sand it down and paint the scalloped edge. But I don't wanna mess with it while it's still kind of freshly drying. So I'm gonna set that aside and we are gonna do the smaller version. We are gonna start out with this eight inch round that I picked up from Michaels. I got it 50% off, it was $3. Same with these candlesticks that I'm using. They were 50% off being $3 a piece. And so similarly to this one, we are going to find the center and then attach this, but then we are gonna do the scalloped edge on this one. I'm worried that because this is on an angle that they will kind of cave inward like that. So we, we're gonna have to do something to keep them upright. And again, it's gonna be just the same process as before of hot glue and E6000. Yep. I think what I'm gonna have to do is I am gonna have to definitely do something here to keep it the way we want it. I was afraid of this. So yeah, we're gonna have to do this all the way around just because otherwise our scalloped edge will cave in. I am covered head to toe in glue. So the hard part is done. We've got our scalloped edge on. You could leave it alone and leave it just like this and paint it up and stain it and, and call it a day. I want mine to be a little bit more smooth. So I'm gonna actually take some joint compound since we're painting it. If we were staining it, you'd wanna use wood filler, but I'm just gonna use some of the spackling and then we're gonna let this dry. You don't have to do this step. I just am doing it because I want it to be as close to the original as possible. Let it set till it's completely dry and then I'm gonna sand it down. I am so thrilled with how these are turning out so far. They are so cute. But I do have to tell you, I think the easier way to do this, believe it or not, is to cut the two rounds because trying to brace this so that it wouldn't cave in on an angle was very tedious work. So having the other circle behind it, I just think that that's the better way to go. And it's also the cheaper one. But we learn as we go. And if you don't, again, if you don't have the jigsaw and you've got time, it's gonna have a very similar end result. So I think that that will be good. Now it's time to give the scalloped edge that metallic bronze finish that was on the inspiration one. I'm gonna be using Craftsmart Onyx in the premium metallic acrylic paint. And this was like $1.79, not on sale. If I'm just gonna brush this on, and again, if you wanted to tape this all off and use spray paint, you could, but I'm just gonna go ahead and paint the scalloped edge, just being very careful. Our scalloped edge is dried, and honestly, I think if I were to redo this, I would probably go ahead and use the spray paint. I think it would go a little bit faster and also give like a little bit smoother of a finish. But I'm okay with this, and we're gonna go with it anyways, unless I change my mind. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> so for right now though, we need to amp up the farmhouse rustic on this wooden cake stand because it's by Magnolia Home. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this same Kona color gel stain that I've used for the past several tutorials. I still have a ton of it left. So we're gonna do this very dry. So I'm gonna get some on my brush and then I'm gonna wipe a lot of it off because if you compare it to their cake stand, they just gone in and kind of just dry brushed very subtly. And so that's all we're gonna do here is keep it really subtle. So I'm done giving the rustic vibe to the tear trays. I've done antiquing them. I'm really happy with how they turned out. I'm gonna let it set a second before we put our polyurethane on. So I want to protect the finish. And so I'm gonna be using this premium spray enamel. This is not gonna be food safe, but I don't feel bad because the original wasn't food safe either. Just put something down underneath it 
just some sort of separation between your food and this. And we can use this for decor display. We can use it for cupcakes and cakes. My Magnolia Home cupcake stands and cake stand is done and overall I'm very happy with it. And I'm going to be using this all the time. I think I've got the finish of it pretty close to that of the original. So actually the bigger one she came in a little bit less expensive. I'm going to call this one $5 and this one is more like $8 versus $28 and $40 respectively on their sizes. So we, we did really good on budget. I might actually make the little bit bigger version so I could do the three tier tray. So our Joanna Gaines inspired DIY, she is really known for her bakery sign. It's in her bakery near the silos. She has it up there on the brick wall, but she's also used them in her fixer upper show. And that's the one that we're going to do today, just because I felt like it would be a really easy project for anybody to do. I have this piece of scrap wood. It's measures 12 by 36 and I had this on hand free free to me because it was left over from something else you could go into home improvement store and a lot of people will leave their cutoffs that they don't want for their projects and you can find a thin little piece of wood like this prior to painting we're going to take our three quarter inch square dowel and measure them for a frame I just do a blunt edge cut and you can get away with making this cut by just using a Dollar Tree hacksaw for this simple cut Then we're just gonna paint the main piece in a white chalk paint and the frame I decided to do in a black chalk paint for a higher contrast look. I attach my frame by using an electric staple gun with brad nails from the backside so you don't see any nail holes. Now we're ready to make our stencil. We are gonna be making a stencil out of removable vinyl. I bought this huge roll of Cricut vinyl. It's white because it doesn't really matter because we're just using it as a stencil. And when you buy it in bulk, it's a better deal that way. I've had a lot of people tell me that they are intimidated by these Cricut machines, but really they are not that difficult to use. Once you go in and start playing with it, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. And before you know it, you will be a pro at it. <laughs> We're gonna go into Cricut Design Studio and type out the word bakery. Now I used the font Arial Black. Then you can split all the letters and then we can put one underneath one another. And then there's this really cool thing. If you highlight all of them, you can click align. So it aligns them top to bottom. And then you can also align it from left to right. So everything is nice and aligned. Due to the size of our stencil, we need to split up bakery in half to create two stencils. You do this by creating a rectangle and placing it behind the B-A-K. And then you duplicate it and place another one behind the E-R-Y, making sure to align Line the two rectangles. Then you're going to want to make sure each rectangle is attached to the associated letters. Then you're going to want to highlight both stencils and adjust to the appropriate size. And then we hit make it. Cut out your removable vinyl to the size you need and place it onto a standard mat, smoothing it out. Then, as before, we load our mat into the machine by hitting the arrow buttons and then we hit the C button for cut or cricket. <laughs> then, once it's done cutting, we unload it from our machine and we take our hook and we weed out what we don't want. Then we take our transfer tape and smoothly apply it over the top and then we can peel back our stencil and it's ready to go. Then we're going to lay our stencil down onto our finished board making sure it's smooth and then we peel back our transfer tape leaving our removable vinyl on the wood piece. And then we're gonna go ahead and paint the white chalk paint over the edge of the stencil let that dry and then what we're going to do is go back on top with our black chalk paint and fill in the stencil 
Now when that is fully dry, then you can just peel back your stencil and reveal your bakery sign, which I think is a really cool thing. If you want to do it with a vinyl, you could do it either way, just whatever your preference is. I just wanted to show you the option of doing a stencil. Now in keeping with Joanna Gaines' flair, I roughed up the sign with a little sandpaper. Now I haven't decided exactly where I'm gonna hang this yet, but it will probably go somewhere in my kitchen, obviously. Well, I decided to do a black frame on mine. I think it's a pretty close replica and I only spent less than $5 for my version. Probably the only change I would make is to make the letters a bit wider if I were to redo this. So you may wanna keep that in mind for your project. My last Joanna Gaines inspired DIY, we are gonna be using the Cricut Joy. So on Joanna's Magnolia Home website, she has these signs that are so cute that are painted out in these kind of muted tones like navy blue that have just simple sayings on them. And the one that we're gonna be doing today says seek beauty in all things. I just like that saying, I thought it was really sweet. And we're gonna be making that on our Cricut Joy. And this is their newest machine. It's tiny, it's so portable flexible yeah it still does quite a lot so I picked up this wood canvas I use this wood canvas in a lot of my DIYs I get it at Walmart and it's a 10 by 10 inch canvas prior to painting we are going to create a frame from half inch square dowels we are going to miter cut our corners using this handy new tool called miter shears this cuts perfect 45 degree angles and we just go all the way around then we're gonna paint the main canvas, but leave the frame in its natural color to mimic the inspiration piece. We're gonna just paint it out in a navy blue, and then we're gonna cut some vinyl on our Cricut Joy here. What's fun about a Cricut Joy is they actually have something called Smart Vinyl, which does not require a mat, but they do also have a mat if you, if you would like to use a mat. They have this little tiny one. Isn't that adorable? So you can use this and use traditional vinyl, you know, if, if you have some of that that you want to use. So to use the Cricut Joy is actually pretty simple after setting it up on the device of your choice. Just flip the lid open, make sure it's plugged in, and I'm going to be using Cricut Design Studio on my phone, actually. And I will just go into the app and type in our saying and put it in Times New Roman font. I adjust the size to make it six and a half inches wide, and then we're ready to go. We control the entire cut through the app. The Joy will sense the smart vinyl and feed it into the machine and then you will just hit make it on the app and then it cuts away. It's very, very simple. Then just cut off the vinyl that you used and weed it just like you would any other piece of vinyl. Then you take some transfer tape and place that over the top of your quote. Make sure it's applied securely and smoothly. And then just peel back your quote and stick it into the center of your canvas, taking your scraping tool and rubbing it onto the wood. Then just peel back your transfer tape and your saying is there. Now we're gonna attach our frame by using some E6000 glue, allowing it to fully dry. Now, this is almost a near identical match. I could have probably tightened up the spacing a little bit on my letters, but with the help of the Cricut Joy, I was able to get this done for about $7, which is a huge savings off of the original, and I am really happy with the end result. You know I must love you because I am out here braving the cold. It's 54 degrees and that's basically freezing in Florida. <laughs> I've become a total featherweight since moving to Florida. Now I'm a pansy. I will own it. <laughs> so I've got Baby Yoda here with me today and we are going to be knocking off a Pottery Barn Kids Star Wars marquee sign. And I'm really excited about it because we're gonna be doing it for a fraction of the cost. This is actually a scrap piece of wood left over from my Pottery Barn knockoff of a craft table. And so this was free to me. And there is a way to get free wood. I have told you about it in the past look through Facebook marketplace lots of people are always trying to get rid of their free scrap wood you can check construction site dumpsters this is a scrap so 
this was no cost to me and I'm counting it as no cost. We're gonna start out by marking out the dimensions which are 24 inches by 40 inches. And so we're gonna just measure, and I have a fun measuring tape because you mark where you want, which is 24 inches, and then you push it down and then it makes a mark for you. All right, so now we're gonna trim it out on the back. I start out by cutting some one by two inch flat molding down to size. This is to help disguise all of the cords and such. So now it's time to nail the trim on the back and we're gonna be nailing it directly from the front. I'm gonna be using my finished brad nailer, but you can use a hammer and finish nails as well. That would be perfectly fine. This just makes it go a little bit faster and I love it, it's my favorite tool. And then we'll just go back and spackle it a little bit and so it will be nice and smooth. All right, let's sand this up. So now it's time for me and Baby Yoda to get this painted up. And I've decided not to go ahead and drill the holes first because I think it will be easier to paint it all out and then drill holes. So actually the holes are gonna go in kind of last. You'll see, and it's gonna work out good. And I am using Rich Black by Folk Art, their chalk paint. And we're gonna get this painted up and I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for the fun part. We're gonna cut our Star Wars logo out of vinyl and you're gonna need two packages of this 12 by 48 inch permanent silver vinyl that I got from Cricut. It's a permanent vinyl so it should last and stand the test of time. Because of the size of the marquee, you are going to need a 12 by 24 inch mat. I've gone ahead and done the hard part for you and I've designed this so it's all ready for you to cut and I will provide a link for it in the description box. All you need to do is go in and hit make it. Then all you need to do is weed out the part that you're not going to use and apply your transfer tape so that you can apply it to your piece of wood. All right, now this is where we get to see some of the payoff. We are going to lay out our Star Wars vinyl and apply it to the board. Make sure everything's nice and lined up and that nothing's crooked and that it's nice and centered. I'm gonna just do kind of a rough layout and then we will stick it down with the, our transfer tape. Now it's time to add the lighting element, the marquee part of the sign. And we've made it really easy on ourselves because we've put where we need to drill a hole in the vinyl lettering. So everywhere there's a circle, we're gonna use a wood boring dr drill bit with our drill to drill a hole. So we can just center it up, drill, and that's where we are going to put a light. Okay, so this is obviously a very, very messy process. But this is not the part that I'm really worried about. Baby Yoda and I made a boo-boo. Do this on wood or some place where, maybe on the ground. Maybe on the ground. That would have been good. Drilling the holes is going to make kind of a mess, so just go ahead and wipe down the sign with a wet washcloth and let it dry. Okay, so now it's time to add the lights, and I picked up these string lights on an after-season clearance sale at Michael's. They were $6 a box, and there's 30 lights in them. We only need 39, so I'm actually gonna have to use two boxes of them, and I'm just gonna unscrew the light bulbs and store them for later, because yeah, we may need to replace some light bulbs here and there. So Christmas is coming really quick, and there's gonna be some great after Christmas sales. So grab them on the after season sale, and just keep your eyes peeled for a good deal. So after you unscrew all the light bulbs from the string lights, then you're just gonna simply push them through the hole Holes, weaving them back and forth until you've got them all pushed in. Now if you have some extras just unscrew the light bulbs it's not like Christmas lights where they will be out. Then you will just tape everything to the back with duct tape. I would recommend Gorilla Tape. It works a little bit better. So this awesome sign will be going into my son's bedroom which I will be doing an extreme makeover on in January so stay tuned for that. Can you tell the difference? Our sign is hung up. I'm really excited about it. Now, Baby Yoda is going to use the power of the force to turn it on. Thank you so much, Baby Yoda. 
Isn't he so cute? I just love him. My next Pottery Barn dupe is the Aero Vine Baskets. Now, they no longer carry this on their website, but they were really cute. So this will serve as dual duty. If you like these baskets, I'm gonna show you how to make your own since they no longer carry them. But when they originally did carry them, they range between 40 and $60 per basket. I'm gonna be attempting to make the larger basket today. And fortunately for me, I already had everything on hand. Now my husband's always saying, why do you need all this crafting stuff? Well, because right now I can't go out shopping because we're doing social isolation and so it's perfect. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this basket and this is from the Dollar Tree. And so $1, very affordable. And I really like the shape of this. This is really great. And also the mesh on it will serve as a really good opportunity for us to attach our grapevine. Now I have this leftover from a fall decorative pumpkin project that I did. I ordered this off of Amazon. I believe it was about $7.50. I'll also provide a link for one of these in the description box below. We are going to be using it to wrap around this basket and as our handle, which brings us to our handle. Now I didn't think that this grapevine would be quite strong enough in and of itself. I wanted to give it a little bit more substance. So necessity is the mother of invention. So what could we do to add support to our basket handle? So I went looking for an old wire hanger from the dry cleaners and we are going to try to be making and fashioning some support for a handle with this and we'll combine it with a grapevine so it will have a nice look. But this wire hanger should hopefully add a little extra stability for our handle so you could actually hold it by the handle in theory. So that's what we're gonna try to do with this. So I start out by untwisting the wire hanger to separate it, and then I unbend it and shape it into a U. Then I hooked one side onto the basket and twisted it on. Now, I don't know if this is a good idea or if I should have just waited, but it ended up working out fine in the end. I cut a long enough piece of the grapevine wreath to fit on the hanger. and slide the hanger through the middle of the grapevine and then securely fasten it on to the other side. I add extra wire where it connects to the mesh basket to make it really sturdy. Then I start wrapping the vine around the mesh basket. And once I have it basically in place, I strategically wire it to the basket. As I go, I remove some of the existing wire that holds the grapevine together so I can loosen it up and kind of spread it out a little bit. I use the original wire from the grapevine and I cut it into four pieces. I use that to wire it to the basket. Now that I have it basically how I like, it's time to add moss. So I've got my cordless Mac Daddy hot glue gun Sure Bonder. This comes in a mini, which I'm gonna be using today, but I am loving this glue gun because it's cordless. So it, the cord doesn't get in the way of your crafting. And then you just put it on the base and it charges while you're not using it. So it is awesome. I have so loved that. And the link for that will be below as well. Next, I randomly place the glue and moss sporadically around the basket.
cut off a little bit of boxwood that I had on hand and strategically place that around the basket. Now this is not on the original one, so this is totally optional for you, but I thought it looked really cute. Then I took it outside and I sprayed it with a couple of coats of hairspray just to make sure that everything stayed in place a little bit better. Now I wasn't gonna do the arrangement originally, but I decided to go ahead and do it last minute so it would match the after pictures a little bit better. So I didn't get footage of this process, but I literally just had these daisies on hand and found some extra greenery and I kind of threw it all together last minute. It was easy peasy. And to be honest with you, I actually like my version better than the original and their version was $60 and mine was just 11 and would only be around $9 without the flowers. So what do you think of it? My next knockoff is a tulip place card holder. Pottery Barn sells a set of four for $30 and we are going to be doing ours for a tiny fraction of the cost. Now fortunately I'd already purchased these things because when I see them I like to stock up on these tiny little pots. They are so cute. You get three for it all that makes them 33 cents each and then I have some tulips left over from my last episodes project and I think that they're gonna be perfect for this project and they're about 50 cents each then we're gonna use again some of our moss from Dollar Tree we won't need very much and then I also have some scraps of styrofoam left over from my last episode so these are like the bare bottom but you don't need much because these pots are pretty tiny from my last year's place card holder I I just went and yanked them out for this project so that I didn't have to make new ones and I even though know, they're easy I just hot glue them in so if I wanted to go put them back in it all I'd have to do is glue them back into place that's all the supplies so let's get putting it together this project is ridiculously easy to put together you start out with your mini pot you need a small amount of styrofoam and you place it in the pot so it's nice and snug then you take two tulips and cut them about an inch below the base of the leaves. Then you put two tulips in one side and then again on the other side. Then I put some hot glue down on the foam and take a chunk of moss and fill it in so you can't see any of the foam. Then I take my pre-made wire from my last year's place card holders and shove it in the middle. All I did with this was kind of take some wire and make a curly cue and then straighten it out on the end. It's a pretty easy process if you look at it. Also, another solution for you is to take the bottom section of the tulip. It also has a wire in it that slides right out and you could definitely curl that in the same manner as the ones that I used and basically have a free version. Again, I like mine better than the original. I like the pinker version of the tulip and I think these are just really amazing. And at only $6 for a set of four versus 30, it's got a better price to boot. But what do you think? My next Pottery Barn dupe is the most beautiful pink peony arrangement. It was so pretty and I looked at the price tag and it was $369. You heard that right, $369. It was so expensive and I just know that I would never personally pay that because, well, I can make it myself and I want to teach you how to do it too to save yourself a little bit of money. So what I liked about the arrangement was the beautiful vase that it was in. It had a beautiful crystal vase with like a little stem on the bottom and then it had these beautiful pink peonies. I love peonies. They're some of my favorite flowers. Peonies and hydrangeas are two of my favorite flowers. I just love them. I love the way they look. They're so romantic. But at $369, I was like, 
we can get that look for less. So I thought that this would be a perfect dupe, especially with Mother's Day right at our front door. This would be an amazing Mother's Day gift, or even for your own home decor. It's beautiful. Pink peonies are amazing. So I'm going to put all of my supplies in the description box below. All Everything that I use will be there, so you don't need to worry about that. Now I had this vase on hand. I really lucked out. I had found it at a Goodwill a couple of years ago. I paid about $2 for it, so it was super cheap, and I had it on hand, and it was about the right size, and, and it had a similar design on it. So for me, this is perfect. So go into Goodwill or your thrift store. You'll find tons and tons of vases there. It can be hit and miss. Then I got this um, candlestick from the dollar store. And I did this already because I wanted it to be really set up for this video, is I took some E6000, glued the candlestick to the bottom of the vase, and now we have a very similar style vase to the one from Pottery Barn. And what I've done, I bought two bunches of pink peonies off of Amazon and they were $18.99 for both of them, which is really good price because they were pretty full sized um, bunches and the quality of the pink peony was super high. It was really, really high, beautiful peonies. But then I knew I needed a little bit hot pink because if you look at the original inspiration piece, there's a couple of more intense hot pink peonies in that arrangement and what made it nice is that there was a great big mixture. So I went over to Michael's and I got these and they were having a 60% off sale. So they're originally $5 a piece and this was 60% um, off making them $2 a piece. So that is a really good price. All we're going to do is it's just a mounded arrangement. So I've, I've taken my wire cutters and pre-cut all of the bushes apart and shortened all the stems of the ones that we're gonna be using. And we are just gonna place them in and just create a nice mound. Now what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna make sure that you do some variation of height, just very subtly, because what uh, makes a really nice design mount is when there's like variation of heights. spin around and make sure it looks good on all sides so we'll just make some adjustments here and if one's too long then just take it out and clip off just a little bit at a time um, that way you don't overdo it what I like is that I have some of these little tight buds mixed with some that are kind of medium and some that are fully blown just like you would with a real peony I am so excited about this so you want to disperse all the colors and the textures and you can see that there's varying heights of the peonies. Some are poking out a little bit more than others. Some are tucked in a little bit more than others. And that gives it just kind of a more natural, fun look. So overall, I'm really happy with how this turned out. Now that we've got it arranged the way we like it, what we're going to do is we're going to lift this out and put it in another vase or pitcher or something that can kind of hold the shape while we work on the fake water. Okay, so all we're gonna do is I'm gonna sacrifice this. I got this at the dollar store. If you have a plastic cup, that will work as well. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna use this entire amount of water. What you're gonna wanna do is mix equal parts and they say on the package to kind of do it down the side so it helps with the air bubbles when you do it this pour it in this way we want to get all of it the contents in and it has to be equal otherwise the curing time will take longer it might create more air bubbles so while we mix this for three minutes i was just wondering if there are any other things you would like me to do about there any designer items that you would love to see me do if so, let me know in the comment section below. I'm always looking for ideas of things that I can do for you guys. It's time to pour it into our base. Now, as we pour it into our base, um, we want to be very careful to avoid the sides of the base because if so, it will get on the side. So we're gonna aim for the center. 
Also, you wanna make sure that it's clean and free of any water or dust or anything because anything that's in there will be in there for good. So we're gonna pour our fake water in very, very carefully right in the center. So now I've tried this with an epoxy before and it just takes so much epoxy and it's just not as pretty. So you really want to do stick with the water kit. Now we're gonna very carefully gather our bouquet out of the temporary container and we're gonna gently set it in, make sure all the stems are inside the vase and then just very carefully set it into place. Now it is a little bit of little bit forgiving, so if everything doesn't pop right back into place, we're just gonna make a couple of modifications before it sets up because it actually takes about eight to ten hours to cure. So we've got a little bit of wiggle room. You don't want to move it too much, you know, just because you can make a mess out of it, but you know, pushing things in or making small adjustments, that's quite all right. So I am really excited with how this is looking overall. This was less than So excited about this because every holiday season I think everybody goes online and looks for ideas and kind of to see what sounds good and what looks good to them and I kept seeing a common theme of these bunny dishes they are so cute I found a couple of sets one from Pottery Barn and one from William Sonoma that I loved I loved both of them I thought they were adorable and then I looked at the price and I was like hold up how much and it was between $50 and $60 for a set of four plates. And I was like, no, nope, nope, nope. Especially when I need like a set of eight to, to set my table. I'm gonna show you how to do it for less than 10%, about $5 for um, the set of four plates. And you're gonna have made them yourself, so you're gonna be so proud of them. And they're gonna be cute, and we're gonna do this. So let's get started. Here's how we're gonna go about it. I'm gonna give you like a general idea and then we're gonna start. So I've got these clear plates that I got at the Dollar Tree. And then I have a set of four royalty-free hand-painted bunnies that I printed out on my printer. We're just gonna start by cutting them out and then we're gonna decoupage them on and then we're gonna paint some cool designs. Now, I don't know if you can see it in the background here, but this is my um, Pottery Barn version and this is my William Sonoma version. They're so cute. What we're gonna want to do very first, well, let's move our cute little bunnies out of the way for just a second. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our plates and we're gonna peel off the sticker and then it came off pretty good, but there's a little tiny bit of debris. And just to avoid debris and fingerprints and all of that, we want it to be very clean. So I just have a cotton pad and some rubbing alcohol. And we are going to just clean the back of it. That dries very quickly. Now on the our inspiration piece, there's a kind of a brown banding around the edge, just very subtle detail. I've got a paint pen here from Craftsmark. I couldn't find the color name on it. We're gonna use this for the edge banding here. This is the first thing we need to do is do the edging because we can't have it mixed with anything else. So you, you shake it and you get it on there. And then we're just gonna go around and we're gonna hit up the edge you can kind of see that it has a lip. We're just very carefully moving the plate, not the marker. And it's okay if it's a little imperfect, but we're trying to try to get it as even as possible. We're gonna let this dry. It doesn't take very long at all. And um, while we're letting it dry, we're gonna cut out our bunnies. 
I love these bunnies. These are so cute. Stay tuned to the end and I'll tell you where you can where I got these ones. But honestly, you can go and find whatever bunny you want. I've got my little kid craft scissors. That's fine. You can use whatever you want. It doesn't have to be like uber perfect cutout job, but you just cut as close to the edge as you can. So we have our cute little bunnies all cut out. They are so cute. I am so in love. Now this is dry. Now we can decoupage our bunny on. Which one should we do? Hmm. Well, let's try this one. This is very important. You need to get dishwasher safe Mod Podge. If you don't, then they're not going to be washable. If you want to wash them, you've got to use the dishwasher safe Mod Podge. So make sure that you get that. We are going to um, put some Mod Podge on the front of our rabbit. Enough that it'll stick, but not like globby at all. Before it dries, very carefully, because you don't want to rip the paper that's already wet. We're gonna bring our plate over and we are gonna try to center it or just place it where you want, where you think. So he touches the bottom and then his face will show. So we're gonna start at the bottom and we gotta be careful around where it bends um, so that it doesn't crease. You just kind of work with it and work out any um, kinks. And if a little bit hangs off the edge of the plate, that's okay because we'll just trim that up later. More, We're more trying to get this to lay nicely on a plate that bends. Totally adorable. But we're gonna leave it upside down to dry and then um, once it's dry, we'll give it like an hour or two. We'll come and put another coat of Mod Podge on the back end before we start applying any paint. Okay, so our Mod Podge has dried. Look how cute these are. Now we need to do a coat on the back side. So we put it on the front side. Now we're gonna put it on the back side. And what we're gonna do in this case, I am just gonna go just outside the cutout and make sure that the cutout itself is covered thoroughly and then we're gonna let it dry for another hour or so so this is gonna take a little bit of time um, but it's gonna be so worth it this is where it gets all kinds of crazy all kinds of fun and all kinds of messy if you have a manicure it's toast, but you'll earn one after you do this and you can feel good about it because of all the money you saved. So, okay. So I got this stencil at Michael's for, it was originally $10. I used a 40% off coupon, so it was $6. We can use it for all of our plates. And it's from um, Martha Stewart collection and it's an ECOT. Um, so we're gonna use this to kind of mimic the pattern in the Williams Sonoma version and it works out really great. So, but it's gonna be messy, I'm not gonna lie. So we just lay it down on the plate and where it bends, we're gonna have to push it down kind of like this. So we may start from the top and then like work our way back and then you're gonna have to fill in a couple of holes here and there and I'll show you how that goes. So again, we're gonna use this um, Whispering Turquoise as our kind of um, blue. Hopefully it's not crazy intense, but it will be fun. So we'll start up here and we just get it wet, dab it off a little bit. You don't want it too wet because then it will leak. And we are just gonna try to do this. And what's nice about this e-cut pattern is it's already kind of naturally messy. And so if it's not perfect, it's okay because it's e cut. You want it to go on a little thick while not being runny, only because you're not gonna get a second chance to put on a, like a second coat. You can kind of touch up a, 
a couple of spots here and there, but generally speaking, this is your one, one shot. So we're gonna take this up and there's gonna be a couple of bare spots. So we're gonna just randomly take, um, so we've got like this outer corner thing and uh, some of these, and I am just gonna randomly place to fill in a hole that just looks a little too big. By nature of using a stencil, it's gonna get a little bit messy and there might be a couple of spots that you want to go in and clean up. So what you're gonna do is dip a Q-tip in some rubbing alcohol and very carefully just go clean up the couple of areas that you may need to clean up. And then we're gonna let these dry, clean up our messy fingers and we'll be back to finish it off. Now we need it to pop, so we're gonna just paint white over the entirety of the back part and i'm just going to brush this on with some chalky craft paint but you know you could also take some spray paint and spray that on and that would work out good as well but this is what i have and so that's what i'm going to work with we need a brush <laughs> well, i'll just use this one i was going to use a foam brush but we'll just use this one because i have it available So you want to cover the entirety of the back. Make sure you cover the paper. It just adds one more layer of protection on the piece of paper that we mod podged on. And you're probably going to need to do two at the minimum, possibly three coats to get that really nice um, bright white. That's it. And then we're going to let it dry for a couple of hours. We are almost finished. <laughs> I know this is like a lot of passive time, a lot of drying time. The part itself of painting isn't too terribly long, but it's all going to be worth it in the end. Now we've got our two coats of white on and now it's time to seal it because if you want this to be washable, want to even throw it in the dishwasher, I don't know if I'll actually throw mine in the dishwasher, but if you want to throw yours in the dishwasher, then you're going to definitely want to do this step to help it preserve for a long time. So we're gonna pull out our dishwasher safe Mod Podge again. We're gonna do two good coats of this on the back and let it fully dry. Okay, so it says we need 28 days for this to cure, but if we don't have 28 days, we're gonna try out a little hack on that to see if it will work out, but uh, by using the oven. I'll meet you back here in a couple seconds, your time and a couple hours my time. We are done. Our plates are so cute. Would you love these on your table? I've got a couple of them. Classy, yet fun. In this episode, I'm gonna be showing you how I knocked off the Pottery Barn pumpkin patch sign. I believe that I can do this for under $3. Under $3, $3. A $3 price tag is a huge improvement and I'm going to show you how you can do it as well. And on top of that, I'm going to be doing it two different ways. One way that I think is going to be more authentic and a closer match to the original. And then the other way I believe will be a little bit more user friendly, aka a little bit easier to do. The first thing I needed to do was figure out how to do this pumpkin patch design because it was pretty intricate. Lots of different methods that I went through. What I did is I actually designed a printable. I think this printable is an extremely close match to the Pottery Barn version. Stick with me to the very end because I'm gonna tell you where you can get this printable for free. Yes, I'm gonna give it away to you for free. I've got you covered. So that will be a little perk that you can get and I'll tell you how to get it at the end of the episode. So I'll be using this for option two, which I'll explain a little bit later. But I think the way that we're gonna get the most authentic looking result is doing an image transfer. I could be wrong, it might not work out. 
But if all goes according to plan, I really believe this will be the more authentic look. So what I had to do for that is actually do a reverse image of the original printable. I will give you access to both versions and tell you how to do this as we go along. So stick with me, hang on, and I will explain how to do everything. I am starting out with some free scrap wood that I had left over from my outdoor bench that I built. So this is free to me. It is totally possible to get free plywood. If you don't know someone who has a pile of scrap wood, you could hit up a construction site and pick through their dumpster. You could dumpster guide, but I'm not going to tell you whether to do that or not do that. That'll be up to you. But if that makes you a little uncomfortable, you can definitely hop on to Facebook Marketplace. A lot of free scrap wood that people are willing to just give away for free. And you could take a couple of pieces and save them for future projects that um, we may be doing or that you might have that you want to do. Worst case scenario, you do have to buy a small piece of plywood, which shouldn't cost you very much if you're buying it in a small quantity. The original dimensions of the Pottery Barn version were 13 inches by 17 inches. Mine's going to be 14 by 18. My plywood it was already 14 inches wide, so I just decided to make it an inch wider in both directions just for ease. The first thing that I'm going to do is paint my wood it's just to create a nice base for this to go on to so I'm just using some chalk paint because I kind of want it to have a um, flat matte finish to speed up the painting process I just go ahead and dump the chalk paint right on the board and spread it out with my brush simple as that our white chalk paint is dried and now we are ready to proceed with the next step so I have this Liquitex product it's a gel medium in matte and this is left over from my monogrammed Lazy Susan tutorial. If you haven't seen that one, I will put it up above as well as below. This is a gel medium that helps you transfer images. There are some other image transferring mediums out there. I prefer this Liquitex product. I've tried some of the other ones. This one seems to get the best result. So what we're gonna do is very carefully just brush it on somewhat generously onto this wood. And then we are going to take our image and now lay it flat down and rub it onto the gel medium. And then we are going to let it sit for at least two hours for the image to really transfer well and fully dry. Now it's time to remove the image transfer. I am expecting this part to be pretty tedious. I'm gonna start up top and we're gonna wet the paper. And then I also have a bowl of water in case we need it. I've got a rag and we are gently going to start rubbing away the paper and hopefully it will reveal our image. You want to make sure you rub hard enough that the paper comes off, but not so hard that the image also comes off. So we just got to apply the right pressure. We are done with the image transfer portion of the project and I'm really happy with how it turned out. You will see some like scratching from when we removed the paper, but that's actually perfect because there was also those streaks in the original one. So my pumpkin ends up being a little bit oranger than the original. I oversaturated the image on purpose because I believed that it would lighten up a little bit more than it did in the transfer process, but that's okay because I'm really happy with this color. I actually like it a little bit better than the original, which was a little bit more um, tan or yellowy. And this one's a little bit more orangey, which will fit in my decor even better. And then I went ahead and took some matte Mod Podge because this is gonna be outside and I did a coat of that over the top of it just as an added protection. Okay, so now it's time to do option two. Honestly, this is gonna be super easy. All we're gonna do is take matte Mod Podge and put some matte Mod Podge on the back, stick it to our piece of wood, and then do a protective layer of matte Mod Podge over the top and let that dry. The Mod Podge on our option two has dried. It looks great. It actually settled way down a lot of that puckering and bubbling flattened out as it dried. There's a little bit towards the edges in the bottom, but actually that's going to be covered up by our frame, which we are going to do right now. So how we're going to go about doing this 
is we are going to first get it out of the package. <laughs> Done that before. Okay, so we're gonna take our paint sticks. We're gonna line it up with the edges and we're gonna start with the top and bottom piece first. Again, we're not mitering these ones because the sticks are not long enough. If you want a more accurate look, um, go ahead and get some strapping or some kind of flat molding and do the miter edge. But since these are not long enough, we're not gonna do it that way. So we're going to put it underneath and then we're gonna just trace it and that gives us our cut mark. If you don't have a power saw, they sell these $1 hack saws at the Dollar Tree and just very carefully make that cut. And there's our arm workout for the day. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, that did a pretty nice cut. Um, you may want to take a sanding sponge and just kind of gently sand off the, any rough spots on the edge. It fits perfect. We'll just do it all the way around. Now it's time to stain our frame. So I debated many different ways of how to get that old aged barn weathered look and feel. I have put together like a watered down mixture, a warm gray, and then I put some dark gray in it. And then I also put in a little bit of brown, but I'm pulling out my bottomless pit of trusty gel stain and Kona. And what I think I'm gonna do first is kind of do like a very light, dry brushing with the gel stain and then go over the top of it with my watered down gray. And then hopefully the combination of the two will create like a nice depth and richness and still have that aged weathered feel that we really love. But before we dry brush anything, I'm going to take a metal bristled brush. You could probably find something similar at the Dollar Tree and kind of run it with the grain of the wood. It's kind of running some grooves into the wood and that will just kind of add to the effect of the barn wood, which always has kind of like a really rough texture. You could nail this on if you wanted to. I don't want to pull out my nail gun and I think that this will be just fine. And so we'll do some E6000 and then a little hot glue for the instant stick that instant gratification, but the E6000 holds up better over time. It's a much stronger stick. <sighs> okay, and then we're gonna just glue it down and make sure everything is even, and then just do it all the way around. If you plan on hanging it, measure down a couple inches on both sides and mark where you want to place screws. Then screw some short screws in about three quarters of the way, then connect them by wrapping wire on them. And once you have done that, screw the screws in tighter and that's it. We're done. All right, my Pottery Barn pumpkin patch sign is done and I am thrilled with how it turned out. I honestly feel like this dupe might be one of my best yet, but you'll have to let me know in the comment section below. Also let me know in the comment section below if you liked the Mod Pod version or the image transfer version. This one's a little bit easier to do. I think this one is a little bit closer matched to the original. So as far as how much each one of these signs cost me, to have them printed out at Staples was about 70 to 75 cents. And then of course the paint sticks, you're gonna need four of them. That's about $1.33. My plywood was free and the stains and the paints I kind of already had on hand. So if we add in a little extra for all of the supplies that I had on hand, the Mod Podge version would probably come in about $2.50 to $3. This version came in about $3.50, maybe $4. Today I have something very special planned. I am doing a William Sonoma plate dupe of this one right here. Their Friendsgiving 
plate collection. I'm really excited about it because you know me, I love to do designer knockoffs and we're gonna be doing ours for just over a dollar a plate and the originals are around $7 a plate, which in fairness to William Sonoma is actually a pretty decent price for them because normally I've seen some of them get upwards of 12 to $15 for a salad plate. So $7 a plate is actually a pretty good price for William Sonoma but we're gonna do better. For those of you who can't fit a Cricut into your budget yet, hang on with me, I haven't forgot about you, and I will tell you how you can also get a similar look. After you download the Cricut software and set up an account, you're going to start out by opening a new project. I had already preloaded the text image for our knockoff, which I had done on Canva prior, but you can actually just do it right within the Cricut workspace. The font name is Delato de Stato. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced that right. And it's off of defont.com. I will link it in the description box below. This is not an exact match for the original font, but it's very close and I really like the font. I will also be putting the printable for what I used in the description box below. So if you want to just use that instead, feel free to, or go ahead and create your own in Cricut Workspace. So once you have your font or any image in there, go up top where it says fill and select no fill, since this will be a stencil. Because we are using it on the back of a glass plate, this image needs to be reversed. Then go to shapes and select square and unlock it on the bottom left hand corner so that you can turn it into a rectangle. Use the green directional button to shape it to the size you want to fit behind our words, which are thankful and grateful, just like the inspiration plates. Make sure you send it to the back. Then go ahead and duplicate the same image and put it behind the other word. Then click on your rectangle and hit shift and hold it down while you hit the word. And then you're going to hit slice at the bottom of the screen and that will break everything apart. Then you're just going to click on the words and pull them out and hit the X button to delete them. You will do this until all that is left is your shaped rectangle with your words in it. Then you can duplicate these and fit for on a 12 by 12 page. After you duplicate them, you can highlight them and hit attach so they're all linked together. Then go ahead and adjust the size, making sure that you take up as much space as possible up to 11 and a half inches. That way you can cut stencils for all four plates at once. When you're done designing, go ahead and click the green button that says make it. Now we're gonna cut our stencils. So it really doesn't matter whether you use a stencil vinyl or just a removable vinyl. And so I've just decided to go ahead and use removable vinyl. Sorry about the way I talk. I just got back from the dentist and I'm still a little numb. <laughs> We are gonna start out by peeling back the plastic protective layer of our mat. Then we're gonna place our removable vinyl down on the mat, making sure it is nice and smooth. Now go to your machine and hit the open button and it will pop open so nice and smooth. Now we're gonna load our mat by lining it up with the wheels and hitting the load button and just giving it a little extra nudge as you push it in. Then you're gonna hit the C button and then the magic happens. It starts to cut your stencil, which will blow your mind. It's so precise and it's kind of mesmerizing, but it does take a few minutes. Now we're going to do a process called weeding where we get rid of all of the parts of the stencil that we are not going to use. Just get rid of it, toss it. Then you're going to need some transfer tape. You put this right over the top of the stencil. Hopefully you do this a little more smoothly and gracefully than my first couple of attempts. I did get better at it. Then you remove all the backing and then we are ready to put it on our glass plate. The first thing we need to do with the plate is make sure that it is really clean. If you need to use a little rubbing alcohol to make sure that there is no spots and no fuzzies. Then we're just going to stick the stencil right on top of the plate, smoothing it out to the best of our abilities and make sure that it wraps around. If it overlaps on the edges, that's okay because that's how the original was as well. Then we're just going to use a little blue tape or masking tape, whatever your preference is, and mask off the rest of the plate so the only part that is exposed is the words. 
in the inspiration plates the lettering is gray so i just end up using some primer that i had on hand already and spraying that on that is not what i'm going to be using on my table you'll have to check back to see what color i end up doing but I do two light coats of the gray and let it dry. Then we peel everything off, all of the tape, all of the stencil, and hopefully you are left with the work. If there's any overspray or areas that are imperfect, then you can just use either a razor blade or rubbing alcohol or a combination of both. But just make sure that when you go to do this next step that it is all clean and ready for the solid color. Then I spray two coats of white spray paint and let that fully dry. So now it's time to make our dishes dishwasher safe because if we're gonna eat on them, we wanna be able to wash them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put on this dishwasher safe Mod Podge over the back. It does make it dishwasher safe. It does need like 28 days to cure so the sooner the better there is a faster way to do this but i will leave the instructions for that down in the description box below i have a ton of this left over from my easter bunny dish dupe and so we're going to use it on this and i think we're going to have a ton left over from this so this bottle will get you a long way so we're only using a tiny bit of it but it really does work and all we're going to do now that this is dry is we are going to paint this on the back of our dishes and i've got kind of a wide brush that does show brush strokes and that's kind of why i wish they had it in a spray you need to do at least two coats preferably three let it sit an hour in between each coat Our Williams-Sonoma knockoff dishes are done and whether or not they're a great match you'll have to let me know in the comment section below but it doesn't matter because I think these are so cute. I'm in love with them. They were like around $2 a plate. That's a savings of about $5 per plate and that adds up really quickly when you're doing a whole tablescape. So these would make wonderful gifts to give to your guests when they come to your house for Thanksgiving. Plus they are going to be washable. These will be dishwasher safe. What do you think? I am so happy with them. Now on my Thanksgiving slash Friendsgiving table, I'm going to be doing black just because I think that it's gonna pop a lot more than this. But for the sake of the dupe, I did the gray, but just think of the possibilities. You can do any color you want. And on the note of possibilities, I should have invested in a Cricut machine years and years and years ago. I have had so much fun. The results are so amazing. I am obsessed with this. We're gonna be knocking off this holiday arrangement from Pottery Barn and we're gonna be doing it for about 10% of the cost. I picked up this vase at Hobby Lobby. It was 50% off. Now, when you buy something from a craft store, never pay full price for it because it's either gonna go on sale. If it's not on sale, they also have coupons. So whether you're shopping Michael's, Joann's, Hobby Lobby, or any of these places, just make sure you have all the coupons available to you and save some money. But this is gonna be our foundation. The first thing I have is this beautiful velvet amaryllis. I picked it up at Hobby Lobby, 50% off. This is kind of a low arrangement, so we're gonna clip it where we think, and if you're not sure, always better to clip it a little bit longer and then trim it down especially when you've got a stem this long and this has kind of got a thick stem so i'm going to actually take a box cutter and kind of cut through this exterior part just because it is so thick that we need to kind of give it a little help this is going to be a beast and that is too tall <laughs> That might be the hardest part of this whole project is cutting through that ridiculously thick stem. It's about six inches long and it should fit into your vase about like that. We are going to tuck in some of these tiny red flowers and I actually got these at the Dollar Tree. So hopefully you'll be able to find something similar. If not, just kind of look around to see what you can find. It kind of echoes a similar filling as the amaryllis. And so we're not gonna use any of the greenery 
just some of the red flower and we're gonna just set that in there and try to get as much of the stem as you can. Just clip it all the way at the bottom and kind of tuck that in. And it kind of nestles next to the amaryllis. So like the amaryllis, I had a really hard time finding some holly and berries. I did find a couple of options at Michael's, but I ended up getting these ones from the Dollar Tree because I only need a touch of them. It comes on them with some pine cones. I'm not going to use the pine cones because that really wasn't in the original arrangement. So I'm just grabbing off these holly and berries just to add that little touch that I picked up these picks from Michael's, so I kind of shopped all over. You don't have to go shopping all around. You could probably get most of what you need at Hobby Lobby for this project. And so just substitute with similar items. But for the sake of the dupe, I really wanted to try to find it as close as possible to the original. So now I got these picks and they kind of had like some really realistic looking pine and some other greeneries. And we're gonna set those kind of like on the outside of the arrangement. And just to amp up the variegated effect, I just, I'm going to use some of this greenery that I got at Walmart that I had sitting around in the house. Kind of mix it in with the holly and berry and I think it'll do. Then of course, the final touch, the magnolia leaves. Simply pull it apart into three separate pieces. Make sure you kind of bend out the leaves a little bit. That looks good. And we're gonna just tuck some of that in there. And make sure you keep referring back to the picture just to see how you're doing. So we're gonna be using this quick water product. So we're gonna take both of these and we are going to dump them at the same time down the side, trying to avoid air bubbles. You don't want to mix it too fast because it can create bubbles. So we're just going to mix this slowly for three to five minutes. Now we're going to take our arrangement and very carefully lift it out. And I'm just going to hold it in my one hand. And then we are going to take our resin and avoid hitting the sides. So I'm actually going to turn this this way and just get it in the center. And all these little teeny tiny air bubbles will hopefully settle down. I'm gonna just go ahead and set that down. Hopefully it doesn't get too messed up because what I want to do is try to get every little last bit out. And this would probably work better in a narrow container. So if you have a narrow container, go ahead and use that. I just kind of grabbed what I had on hand. Pick up our arrangement. Set it in. And then when you're happy with how it looks, you just let it sit for 10 hours while it cures. Our holiday arrangement knockoff from Pottery Barn is done and I'm really happy with it. I've got about $25 into it, which is actually still a little pricey, but it's a really high quality arrangement. It would make a beautiful gift for somebody or a arrangement that you could use year in and year out and therefore you can justify the little extra cost. You could get a similar look by substituting flowers, using some more stuff from the Dollar Tree, maybe not using as fancy of a vase or maybe you'll even get lucky and find one at a thrift store for less money than I spent on mine. Those are all things to consider when you're doing this. Also, one way to save a lot of money is to get rid of the water kit. Even with using a coupon, it's about $7.50. It doesn't make it as permanent, but it's another cost saving tip for you. So those are all just choices you need to make. My project is from Pottery Barn. I found these alphabet letters and I knew I wanted to do something with some type typography outside and they were about $20 five dollars a piece so that was a little bit expensive now some of my other dupes you'll notice are not the most inexpensive dupes ever but I always try to recreate the looks um, for less 
while still maintaining some level of quality. On my project, I ordered these letters off of Amazon. Um, they were about five to six dollars a piece. It kind of depends on the letter and they are actual wood. Now you can save a little bit more money and do this project for even cheaper if you're doing it indoors. Hobby Lobby has a chipboard letter that's almost identical and it is about $2 a piece and sometimes if you find it on sale or a coupon you might be able to get it as low as a dollar or a dollar twenty a piece so that would even be more savings for you but since mine is outdoors I didn't want to use chipboard I wanted to make sure it was an actual wood letter they're gonna hold up a little bit better with all of the humidity all of the water that's gonna be around so all we're gonna do is spray paint these in black and then I've got a hook that's very similar I'll put the link for these as well so I'm not planning on attaching the hook directly to the letter but instead I actually got a plaque that I picked up from Hobby Lobby on sale 50% off for $12 and I'm going to put my letters and hooks on that. Again you could put these in the mudroom, you could put these on your entryway, use it, spell out the word love, spell out the word um, home, family, whatever, your last name. I'm spelling the word swim for obvious reasons and I will be using ours as a place to hang our beach towels. Okay, so I have a finite amount of time before it rains. It's a little loud from the construction, but I'm gonna have to push through this project because it's gonna rain and I wanna get this project done for you. So let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is I got some Rust-Oleum Carbon Black Spray Paint. It's roof accessory spray paint, which I actually thought would be perfect for outdoors. I, you know, if it's meant for roofing stuff, that sees a lot of weather. So I thought that that would be good. And I also really like the idea of a carbon black spray paint. So we're gonna spray our letters. So our letters are dry and I actually ended up spray painting the hooks. Even though they were already black, they were a little bit more shiny and I wanted them to have the same kind of matted finish as the letters. Pottery Barn hung theirs by screwing right through the letters and that's what we're gonna do as well. So I'm gonna do the screws top and bottom here and top and bottom on the I. And then on the W and the M, we're gonna go on the wide side. So we've got our letters on and now it's time to do our hooks. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this on a wood backing is because the screws that come with the hooks are not very long. And so by screwing them into a piece of wood, that will make them nice and secure. Maybe down the road, I'll add a sealer coat. But as for now, I don't mind it getting a little age on it. I'm gonna hang our swim sign right here. It's right next to my slider glass. It's a perfect place to hang the towels. My sign is up and I'm thrilled with how it turned out. I just wanted to tell you about the cost comparison. So the one from Pottery Barn, if you did this with Pottery Barn, would have been probably over $125. My version is a little less than $40, which is not like the cheapest dupe in the world. And again, you can use the chipboard and get that price a little bit lower as well as get rid of the wood backer board that would also save you some money. So I'm overall really thrilled with this. So I went over to Pottery Barn's website looking for some inspiration for 4th of July and I saw some really cute things there uh, including a table runner and the table runner had two options one was stars and stripes and then one was just stars and I just loved them but they were $70 for the runners and I knew that we could get the look for less so the table runner is going to be an all stars but I knew I needed to bring the stripes out for my patriotic themed table so I went over to their napkin section on Pottery Barn and I came across these really cute ticking napkins and then I looked at the price tag and it was $90 for a set of four. I was just totally blown away. Beautiful though, I loved the way they looked. So I'm like, that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some. Making napkins is gonna be so easy. So I got my star fabric 
from Hobby Lobby on sale for $6.97 a yard. I got two yards because I wanted to have a little extra maybe for this project a little bit later, but I think we're gonna be able to get away with squeezing out in one yard of fabric, and I'll show you how we're gonna do that. My red and cream ticking I also got at Hobby Lobby. It is a really soft fabric. I think it will make great napkins, and it was on sale for $3.49 a yard. Now I wanted to offer you two different ways to do it because I know not everybody sews and doesn't feel comfortable sewing or have a sewing machine. So I'm gonna do each project differently. So for the table runner, I'm gonna be using some iron-on adhesive, and so there won't be any sewing on that. And for the napkins, I just wanted to sew those and just have the, the nice hem on it. I learned how to sew when I was eight years old, and my husband actually sews. I'll probably, I'll probably be in the doghouse for sharing that with you. If I can learn to sew at eight and he can sew, I promise you, you guys, you can do it. Buy an inexpensive sewing machine, possibly borrow one from a friend or your parent or somebody who has a sewing machine that would let you try it out. So making napkins would be a perfect way to start your sewing. But again, I wanted to offer you two options, so we're gonna do both. So let's get started. This will be a no-sew option for you. And you can take these principles and use them on the napkins if you'd like. Um, but again, we're just gonna do it on the table runner for this one. We're gonna be using some heat and bond tape. You could use peel and stick. It's basically adhesive tape. You're gonna need an iron, so you, I've got mine heating up. So this fabric is only 45 inches wide. If you were able to find a fabric that's similar, that's 54 inches wide, you could do the 108 inches that the Pottery Barn is. I'm only gonna do 90 inches, which is the width of this twice, because my table's a little shorter, and so it will work just fine. You could also cut it the other direction as well. What we're going to do is I'm going to measure my fabric to 19 inches and then I am just going to cut on that line and we're going to cut two panels and at some point you can just fold it over on itself and use itself as the, the pattern. Okay, so now we've got our two panels. And before I start doing anything, I always like to press out my fabric so you can get out any wrinkles and have a nice fresh start. All right, so we're done ironing our panels. And what we are going to do now is we are gonna take our bonding tape out of the box so we can use it. So we're gonna have to put a seam in ours because I'm using two panels. And I thought that that would be okay because the, I'm gonna be putting a centerpiece over it and I just didn't think that it would be a big deal if it had a seam in it. So we're gonna take our hem tape and we're gonna match it up to the width of our runner. And then we are going to cut it. And then we're gonna iron this on. And just to protect our iron from getting all gooey, I'm just gonna put a paper towel down. And you can see that we've got the tape on. And now we need to peel it back. And we are gonna take our other panel and we are gonna put right sides together and line it up really nicely. Just kind of slowly iron it on. It doesn't take too long. You wanna make sure that you melt the glue you should have a seam. Okay, so I allowed it to cool and then I kind of folded it out and pressed down the middle just to create a nice crisp seam. Now we're gonna start doing the edge banding. Now I'm only gonna be using this maybe a handful of times, so we'll probably pull it out on Memorial Day and 4th of July. So the proper way to probably do this is to go around, create a lip, and do like a finished edge. But I'm just gonna leave the rough edges exposed and that's gonna be fine. That's not gonna be getting heavy use. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kind of repeat that process on all of the seams. So just follow the instructions on the box as far as how long to hold the iron down. That creates a nice crisp line without stitching. This is our no sew table runner. Looks so much like the original $10 versus $70. And if you wanted to save a few extra bucks, you could sew it and it would be a little bit cheaper because you don't have to get the hem tape. But that turned out so good. I'm so thrilled with it. I'm ready to start my napkins that are gonna be just a ginormous amount of savings. What I'm gonna do is this fabric should tear and give us a straight line. So I'm just gonna start by tearing the fabric to get us on a straight line. 
that will help us just keep the squares nice and square. And sometimes it will like kind of snag a little bit and you just take your fingers and run it along and pull out that snag. We are making 20 inch squares. So what I'm gonna do is measure down 21 and a half to allow some seams. And this should tear straight. So I just make a snip and then I rip it. And we're gonna just do it the same thing in the other direction. Make a snip. I usually snip about an inch so you have enough to grab and then. So that's our first square. It causes it to kind of curl around the edges. So I think at this point I will iron them out. I'm gonna need six for my table. So you just tear out what you need for yours. I wanna show you how I do this. And I've already done it on the sides, but we just fold it up like a quarter of an inch. And I'm just eyeballing it because this doesn't really need to be that perfect because we're not hemming something. It's just to have a nice finished edge and not have a frayed edge. So I'm eyeballing about a quarter of an inch and I'm pressing it down with the iron, which creates a nice crease. And this iron does a fantastic job. We're gonna fold it over about a half an inch. Again, I'm just eyeballing. But what I wanna show you is here on the corner. I actually fold it on a 45 degree angle and I kind of tuck that in. You don't have to do that, but it just gives it a more finished quality. With this all ironed and with all of these edges ironed down, we are ready to sew. So I'm gonna sew up the seams to this. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes, but if you're not sure how to sew, you're gonna wanna pop on over to my IGTV channel because I show you all of the sewing basics from threading the machine to winding a bobbin to doing a straight stitch. It's all in my episode this week over on IGTV. So if you already sew, then all you do is sew it up and that's what we're gonna do right now. our set of four napkins. These were about $5 versus $80. Massive savings, same look. If you enjoyed this episode, here's another one that I think you'll like as well. If you haven't already done so, consider hitting that subscribe button. I would love to see you around here again. And until next time to all of my DIY Niners, bye.